Good afternoon and welcome to OPR's webinar, Implementing SB 743, What You Need to Know. My name is Beth Hotchkiss and I'm a program analyst at OPR and I'll be monitoring this webinar with assistance from my colleague, Natalie Kuffel, who's our land use counsel. Thank you all for joining us during this difficult time and we hope that you will find this webinar helpful as we're working to meet the existing July 1st deadline for implementing SB 743, which changes how transportation impacts are analyzed under CEQA. The agenda for today's webinar will be as followed. OPR's director and governor's senior advisor, uh, Kate Gordon, will be kicking us off with an introduction. The bulk of our time will be devoted to a presentation on OPR's recommendations for SB 743, uh, implementation by OPR's senior legal counsel, Jeannie Lee, and senior advisor for transportation, Chris Kinson. Mia Kang, our, our sen senior vice president at Related California, will be joining us at 3.45 to provide a developer's perspective. And in the last hour, we'll hear from UC Berkeley's Center for Energy and Center for Law, Energy and the Environment and from the city of San Jose. Ethan Elkind, director for the climate program and Ted Lamb, a climate law and policy fellow will be discussing mitigation strategies. Ramses Madao, division manager for planning policy and sustainability for the city of San Jose's Department of Transportation will present on how San Jose has implemented SB 743. We have a large number of attendees at our webinar and a large amount of material to cover. So we'll be limiting questions to the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. Please type your questions there as you think of them. We have enabled the feature should you, uh, that will allow you to vote for questions that others have asked and that you would like to see answered. Rather than type the question again, please use this function. Natalie and I will be reviewing these questions and asking them to our speakers during the designated breaks in the presentation. If we have time at the end of the webinar, we'll be using that to answer more questions. We'll be prioritizing uh, clarifying questions that will help the majority of attendees implement SB 743. We will likely not be able to answer all the questions submitted and will not have the ability to monitor comments submitted via YouTube live stream. But we will use your questions to help guide the development of a forthcoming FAQ document to be posted on our website or address them in our upcoming online office hours. If you have any questions that are more detailed or specific to your jurisdiction or project, we ask that you save those for office hours. Office hour questions can be emailed to sb743questions at opr.ca.gov. Please make sure you are signed up for OPR CEQA listserv, since this is how we'll be announcing our office hour dates and topics. Now that we have addressed housekeeping items, I'll hand this over to our first speaker, Director Kate Gordon. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining the webinar. And thanks, Beth, for that introduction. Um, Beth, I think if you could post those URLs for uh, office hour or for questions in the Q&A box, people would appreciate that. Um, so it's it's great to have everyone on. I know it's an incredibly complicated time for folks, for us too. Um, but it's so important that the function of the government continue. and. We know they're continuing for you, they're continuing for us, and so we're very glad to be able to present on SB 743, which is such a key part of planning for so many of us across the state and in individual regions and cities. The context to SB 743 is important. Over the past century, California has seen just incredible growth in our economy, in our population. We're now, the, as everybody knows, I think by now, the fifth largest economy in the world. Uh, backed by leading industries, by innovation, by diverse regions that are focused on all kinds of different things. And during that time, we built out a state and national highway system in California, which was a huge transportation project of the past. It helped spur development in suburbs outside of our city centers by making it easy to drive between downtowns and suburban housing and services. And uh, that was incredibly important for that phase of development, but it has resulted uh, in part in um, a set of projects uh, to try to ease the congestion created from that sort of bedroom community central job corridor dynamic. And those projects have mostly been focused on freeway widening in metro areas in an attempt to relieve increasing traffic congestion. Ultimately, that widening has led to more driving uh, and, and, more, and continued congested freeways and more development farther and farther away from city centers. All of that kind of way of growing, again, uh, across the last century, you know, during a time of, of huge economic growth, 
all of that way of growing has led to some uh, important outcomes, including a land use pattern that is, is pretty unsustainable as we look forward to increased continued population growth in our state. As housing in the large coastal cities became less affordable, workers have been pushed out to further and further suburbs and exurban areas. And at the same time, inland cities, uh, which were basically bypassed by Highway 5 in an earlier era of planning, have not seen the investment and job growth they require to become true economic anchors for the state and to drive more of that growth and development inland rather than kind of that unequal um, shift from suburbs out to the coast. At the same time, many rural areas and small towns are starting to really feel the pressure of increased population from those who can't find affordable housing options elsewhere in the state. But those areas often don't have the jobs, housing, and services that keep them healthy and vibrant. So the result of that is a huge amount of driving um, and commuting across the state. We're seeing increasing super commuters driving multiple hours each way to jobs, uh, pushing up both housing and transportation costs uh, for households. Uh, worsening congestion in metro regions, both coastal and inland, as we continue to widen roads and freeways that just fill with traffic as soon as the wide projects are complete. A rise in homelessness in our cities, and some of that, frankly, we know from surveys, is due to folks who are working full-time jobs in cities, but they need to live on the streets of the cities in order to get to work on time uh, in the morning and to not incur those incredibly high transportation costs. Declines in health and quality of life, as Californians spend more time in their cars and on uh, freeways and in the air qual poor air quality that is uh, attendant with a lot of uh, cars on the freeways and less time with their families and communities. That's a significant issue where we've seen twice as many traffic fatalities per capita in California as nearly any other industrialized country. Uh, we've seen over 20,000 additional premature deaths every year in the state from sedentary behavior and inactivity. So these, have, these are serious health consequences. We also have seen a loss of our farmland and natural open spaces as they've been increasingly converted to housing where homes uh, can be built in some cases at a slightly lower cost, but that cost is often offset for the families that live in those hou that, that housing by significantly higher transportation costs. So even though the housing portion of the budget might be lower, housing plus transportation is actually often higher uh, in some of those developments. There's also a cost of that land conversion of critical agricultural production. Uh, we're, we're seeing right now, frankly, the, the reason it's important to have food production near where we live, um, but also recreational use and biodiversity. And finally, those natural and working lands actually act as really important um, buffers for some of the, the climate impacts we're seeing increasingly across the state, whether it's wildfire, wetland, um, wetland protection for uh, flooding prevention, um, green space to help offset urban heat island effects, and other climate resilience uh, functions that our natural working lands play. And of course, on a more global scale, we've seen a significant rise in our carbon emissions from vehicle miles traveled. And this is something that the Air Resources Board has pointed out, that if we want to meet our, our climate commitments as a state, we're actually going to have to bring VMT down by about 25% um, over the next couple of decades, because otherwise we just simply will continue to see kind of those emissions rise. And I know this is hard to talk about right now with of course VMT being much lower than usual at the current moment, but we really are looking in this uh, in, in with SB 743 at a, this is a longer term um, uh, project and we're looking at sort of, you know, as our economy comes back online, how do we make sure it's, it's really more resilient and sustainable? We've learned some important lessons in the past half century. We've learned we can't build our way out of congestion through road widening. Um, this is just something that has been, you know, honestly true in transportation analysis since the days of Robert Moses, that adding lanes to freeways accommodates more vehicles, but does not ease traffic congestion because the roads fill up again due to pent up demand. Um, so unfortunately, the thing we're trying to solve does not often get solved by that, so by that, by that kind of project. In fact, the best way to solve congestion is to give Californians the choice to opt out of it to have alternatives to those long commutes, to think about ways of bringing housing toward jobs and jobs toward housing, to create uh, shorter distance commutes for folks to allow for better transit, even bikes and walking in some communities. We just need to be thinking about changes to how we invest in development through transportation planning, but also beyond to make sure that across California, people are able to make the shortest trips possible and able to really enjoy the benefits of living near 
jobs, community, services, and home all at the same time. SP743 is one tool in the toolbox of helping create these better outcomes. One critically important tool, but just one tool. Um, what SB 743 does is allows the state to shift from essentially this outdated metric of transportation planning that measured time spent in traffic congestion that's known as level of service to one that's based on the actual amount that people are driving. That shift has been in the works for quite a long time. Um, the law passed in 2013. It officially goes into full effect on July 1st, but the MT as an analysis tool has already been used CEQA for greenhouse gas emissions, air quality, and energy impacts. Many regions of different types, including lower density regions um, like greater Sacramento area have begun to shift the, to BMT and have specific experience about how to use those metrics. You'll hear later from Mia Kang, who's been looking at those metrics in, um, in Tahoe, which is of course not a super urban area. There's also many resources available today to help lead agencies and practitioners make the shift. OPR is the site of many of those pieces, including the, the overall uh, guidance on, on BMT that the state is using. We'll be talking through a lot of those resources and case studies today. As Beth said, we'll hold office hours. We're very, very open to questions. We at OPR and our, our colleagues at Caltrans in particular are very focused on making this shift as easy and as effective as possible. So for all these reasons, and in light of recent case law reinforcing BMT as the appropriate metric, metric for transportation analysis, we are recommending that folks start including the analyses today in projects if you haven't already, and we are here to help you figure out how to do that. And with that, I'm gonna turn things back to my colleague, Chris Gamble. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, just want to start out with an acknowledgement that we're in the middle of some difficult times and um, with the number of folks on the phone or on the webinar, I, I, I bet someone is having some, uh, some personal contact with the, the issue we're having now with, with uh, the COVID um, virus and uh, just uh, want to take a moment to acknowledge that and, and uh, the, the challenge really that all of us are going through in our daily lives. Um, uh, I'll also say that we are um, on our third um, webinar at OPR um, from all of our own homes, socially distanced and um, working from home. So uh, we ask your forgiveness in advance to the extent we have any technical issues. We're doing the best we can. And uh, it's my understanding in the best of times about um, uh, these, these uh, what the, the uh, webinar uh, systems work about 85 or 90 percent of the time, so we're keeping our fingers crossed that uh, things go smoothly today. Um, uh, that said, we're off to a decent start, I think, and um, so I will uh, start um, talking through some of the first background on 743. Um, some of you uh, may have heard me speak on the background or, or uh, be familiar with this. Um, I, I know there's a lot of new folks to the to the table right now. So I just want to go briefly through um, some of the reasons that, that, we're, um, that uh, 743 was passed uh, and that we're implementing it as we are. So um, things don't look like this, this uh, congested highway out there today, but they did a few weeks ago and uh, they will again once we get through COVID. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so this is kind of a common experience. We've all been behind the wheel of an automobile and been going the same way as a, a whole bunch of other people behind the wheels of their automobiles. And uh, there were so many of us that we got in each other's way and slowed each other down. And that was uh, frustrating to us. And so it's no surprise, um, it's kind of expected that the transportation industry uh, would have done something like we did, um, which is develop metrics uh, to uh, define the problem and solve the problem based on automobile delay. And uh, level of service is a metric of automobile delay, um, kind of at the microscopic scale, looking intersection by intersection or roadway segment by roadway segment. Um, the thing is that in defining the problem that way, we made this um, wild success, even though there's not much of anywhere to go, and this abject failure, even though there's all kinds of places you can get to in just a few steps. So let's dig into a study that explains a little bit what's going on here. Um, 
So on the left axis here, we have a job accessibility score, basically how many jobs you can get to, same on both plots. And on the left plot, um, the x-axis, the horizontal, is jobs within six miles. And it's going to surprise no one that the more jobs you have within six miles, the more jobs you can get to, right? Um, you might also think that the faster you could go in your car in the six miles around your home, the more jobs you could get to. But you'd actually have that backwards. The faster you could go, the fewer jobs you can get to. And the reason for that is that in order to keep traffic speeds up, you need to spread development out. And the spreading turns out to hurt our ability to get places more than the speeding up helps. This study was replicated in another major area in California, same results. And the study authors wrote, the myopic focus on the traffic impacts of new developments, that's um, exactly using LOS on a project level and having uh, the project uh, mitigate its LOS is misguided and may actually decrease accessibility and economic activity in an effort to protect traffic flows. So we're succeeding in keeping traffic going more quickly in certain locations, um, but failing uh, at the greater task of getting people to where they want to go, which is the underlying point of keeping the traffic speeds up uh, by spreading land uses out. <clears throat> so there's an, a deep irony here that using LOS and CEQA, the point of it was to keep traffic flowing, um, but it led to even worse congestion. As Kate mentioned, because you accommodate the automobile first and foremost uh, locally and you get more car travel, but then that spills out beyond the area you've accommodated it onto the regional roadway network and causes congestion. We see that in every major metropolitan area in California and, and uh, for that matter, across the United States. Um, it, we've made it harder to get places using LOS because we've, in addition to the worst congestion, we spread land uses out. And those two factors together have reduced economic productivity. So SB 743 and the use of VMT in CEQA is not just uh, an approach to benefit the environment and human health. This is actually going to help um, by removing an obstacle um, uh, and, and creating positive mitigation and streamlining. We'll get to that later. It's going to actually help with the underlying purpose of transportation, getting people to places. In the meantime, LOS was having poor outcomes for communities. You saw less housing near jobs, less transit and active transportation projects. Those had to contend with accommodating the automobile. Um, more pavement laid down, which created heat island effects, uh, created um, maintenance obligations, um, and more impervious surface leading to runoff, uh, more runoff, et cetera, um, and uh, poor outcomes for human health and the environment. We'll talk about how we're going to get at improving those outcomes, um, talking about the metric we're shifting to, vehicle miles traveled. But in the meantime, if you want to learn more about the drawbacks of LOS, two places you can go. One is on our website. There is a narrated presentation um, uh, on the 743 webpage. We'll give you the URL again at the end. Um, and uh, there is a new uh, a video that's much more polished. Um, uh, you can find it on YouTube by, by uh, searching within YouTube, metric that makes cities worse. So why shift to vehicle miles traveled? Well, there's a number of reasons, but some of them are, a few of them are that it's easy to assess. Um, we're already assessing it in CEQA in order to come to GHG conclusions on GHG and um, uh, energy and other impacts. Um, we're hearing from consultants that it's about 20% of the effort of LOS generally. Um, so there's also the opportunity for widespread streamlining of projects across the state. And, um, and we need to reduce VMT as Kate was pointing out. Uh, we have to reduce VMT in our projects today because we can't do the things later on. We can't retrofit, we can't move that project closer to the city center. Uh, we can't uh, provide it with better street connectivity. Um, can't move it closer to the center, the main street in, in, a, in a rural town. Um, those things have to be done today as we're building our urban fabric out. We can't retrofit tomorrow when we get um, to the need to reduce to near zero greenhouse gas emissions. 
So I mentioned streamlining, and I just want to run through the sorts of projects very quickly that are going to be streamlined. And by streamlined, this doesn't mean, this isn't referring to the easier analysis, the 20% of the effort compared to LOS. This is where you don't need to do that analysis at all. Um, the streamlining uh, will cover uh, transit projects, most infill housing. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, talk a little bit more about several of these, but um, just to catalog them, centrally located office, locally serving retail, transit bike, pedestrian projects, um, livability enhancements and street safety improvements. And once again, uh, for those projects that are not streamlined, which is quite a large share, um, uh, those projects will have a much easier analysis to go through. So no one uh, who's been following 743 isn't aware uh, that central city um, development will not need to undergo transportation analysis will be streamlined. I just want to share some other sorts of projects. They'll um, be streamlining some others that help reduce um, VMT and, and that um, we expect to see uh, more of out of uh, the implementation of SB 743 and VMT. Um, here's a development we'll be talking about in, in greater depth uh, later, uh, Mia Kang, uh, then of Domus Development, will um, be speaking on the, how this project, this is a, an affordable housing project in Tahoe, um, here's another affordable housing project in the North State. Um, uh, another affordable housing project, this one for uh, veterans in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, uh, small town development also. Small towns tend to perform quite well on VMT, have, have a quite low VMT, um, uh, which is not everybody is aware of that. And then suburban town centers um, are a means to reduce VMT and, and uh, in many cases, even create low, low VMT zones uh, around which uh, further um, development can be streamlined. So this is just an example from the Sacramento area, um, showing the areas that again in, in green would be streamlined, meaning they wouldn't need to do any analysis at all if you were, you wouldn't need to do any analysis at all if you were building housing in these areas. And in the areas outside of the green, uh, you would simply need to do the VMT analysis uh, that again is substantially easier than LOS. Uh, here's another example from uh, North uh, San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Santa Rosa area that would be streamlined there. You can see Santa Rosa is a mid-sized city that performs, um, uh, has, has a substantial amount of low VMT area. Um, uh, so digging into the recommendations in our technical advisory on um, uh, which sorts of projects could be screened. Um, we're explicit that you can use the sort of maps that I was just showing you, maps that show where uh, existing development is low in VMT for residential and office projects. And then when you're building uh, new projects in those areas, uh, you can presume that those will be less than significant. There's no need to do the uh, analysis at all. Um, also in transit proximate zones, specifically within a half mile of transit, um, so long as the project is reasonably transit oriented, not, um, not have a, a very low floor area ratio, not be um, uh, parked, over parked, um, and uh, not consistent with SCS. And I'll talk a little bit about the affordable housing requirement a little bit later on. Um, just to illustrate these areas, again, within a half uh, mile of a high quality transit corridor, or a major transit stop. Those are uh, defined in CEQA. <clears throat> and um, we will also, uh, we're also in the process of developing a, a tool site check, uh, which will be able to show you whether a parcel um, is in a low VMT or a transit zone. Um, so that can help. Uh, but many MPOs have already done a lot of this um, work and uh, already have developed maps of both transit areas and low VMT areas. Another um, opportunity for screening is any project that's 100% affordable housing. We recommend um, your residential project 100% affordable. Um, we're recommending uh, presuming that less than significant. We also recommend that in your jurisdiction, if you, um, uh, you're likely to be able to show with some additional research that a lower um, level of affordability, say 50% affordable, is also generates low enough VMT to, to uh, receive streamlining um, in either a wider area across your whole jurisdiction. 
we recommend presuming locally serving retail less than significant. Um, locally serving retail tends to uh, provide a um, destination in the urban fabric that is uh, um, uh, a closer destination, a, sh a trip shortening destination. You, uh, you're no longer going to the Starbucks way across your neighborhood, you're going to the new one uh, that opened up a few blocks away. Um, so we recommend that presuming, let, recommend presuming locally serving retail less than significant. Um, and small projects which generate less, fewer than 100 trips, uh, 10 trips per day, uh, recommend presuming less than significant. So just before I go on, a quick notice to the breadth of this streamline. I just want to give an example from um, the Southern California Association of Governments, um, SCAG. They examined um, looking at the transit areas and the low VMT areas, uh, the, the maps, the green zones on the maps, um, and found that a full 56% of their future residential development um, would be streamlined. Again, not even need to do VMT analysis. Um, the rest of their development would simply need to do that. Again, easier VMT analysis. So just a brief walkthrough, putting a finer point on, um, on uh, what Kate uh, raised, the benefits of reducing VMT and 743 being a key tool, not the only tool, but a key one in doing so. Um, greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Transportation is half of a green, our greenhouse gases in California once you consider extraction, refining, and piping of fuels. And um, so far, unfortunately, we're not doing a great job of containing transportation emissions. The blue-green line shows our trajectory. Uh, the green dots are uh, SB375 targets that we need to hit. So we need to bend the curve pretty substantially uh, to get to even our 2035 targets. But those aren't sufficient to get to our ultimate carbon goals, the scoping plan says we need to do even better than that. Um, so we need to bend the curve even more sharply. Um, so we have our work cut out for us and 743 will help. Um, the California Resources Board is clear and unequivocal that we'll need significant changes to how communities and transportation systems are planned, funded and built if we're to hit even our 2030 climate targets enshrined in law. But also uh, we anticipate really substantial health benefits. Um, Kate mentioned that we see uh, 21,000 deaths a year in, 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 uh, in good times in California due to physical inactivity. And that's uh, in large part because we don't provide sufficient options for people to get themselves places on their own power. Um, when we do so, when we increase our, uh, our, our uh, uh, transit um, bike and ped mode shares, just the small amount that's our current uh, mode share goals, the California Department of Public Health modeled the benefits that that would create in terms of health. And it's over 2000 deaths annually. That's uh, billions of dollars in premature death and disability savings for our state. Um, these benefits are among the biggest that public health um, professionals say are available to us. They're on the level of smoking cessation. So they're really significant health benefits. Um, and also crashes, as, as Kate also mentioned, um, are a substantial um, health concern. And as Kate said, we're uh, about, we have about twice the crash rate of any other industrialized country, up to four times almost, um, some of them. And we know why that is uh, when we look at the most compact counties, this time in the full uh, United States, um, compared to the most sprawling high VMT counties. So the most compact low VMT counties um, have an average fatality, traffic fatality rate of one fifth the most sprawling counties, a factor of five in difference in traffic fatalities. This is the most, uh, the biggest way we lose uh, people ages one to 35 in our society. So there's also an array of environmental um, benefits to VMT reduction, greenhouse gases and air quality, uh, air, air pollution, um, of course, transportation energy, but also building energy. Low VMT development tends to be uh, more building efficient as well and uh, building energy efficient and also building water efficient, less, um, less uh, landscaping to water um, and also less impervious surface, so less flooding and pollution and of course, less consumption of open space uh, sensitive habitat and ag land often here in California. We also need to um, address um, forcefully 
the housing cost crisis we have, and we can't address it by increasing transportation costs and asking people to live um, far away. Uh, when we place uh, housing uh, in far flung locations, we just increase the total, total housing plus transportation cost. Um, even if we, as we look narrowly, we see we may be saving a bit on the housing costs. And uh, reducing VMT, VMT mitigation under 743 delivers the sorts of neighborhoods that people are clamoring to get into, namely walkable neighborhoods. And today we have the problem that when we create walkability or when we have walkability, everyone clamors into those neighborhoods and bids up the price. And sometimes that leads to um, uh, displacement in those areas. What we need to do is deliver these sorts of neighborhoods widespread. Everybody deserves to be able to walk in their neighborhood for health reasons, for community reasons, um, uh, and there's a, a quite a bit more demand than uh, supply of these neighborhoods in our state. So it's it's on us to supply more of them. A number of cities have already made the shift to using vehicle miles traveled. Pasadena, San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, Los Angeles, um, and also San Luis Obispo. Among them, there are probably others um, that I haven't caught yet. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of folks are deep in the development of their VMT approaches. Others are just simply making the shift without a, a lot of front end work. Um, uh, Jeannie will talk a little bit about that possibility and they may bring it up later as well. Um, <clears throat> but for now, I will pause and hand the microphone over to Jeannie Lee, our chief counsel, who will run through um, the statute and the CEQA guidelines implementing the statute. Jeannie, yours. Thank you, Chris. Um, good afternoon, everybody from my home in Sacramento. I am Jeannie Lee with OPR. We hope that everyone is staying safe and healthy during this unprecedented time. And we are certainly thankful that so many of you could join us today for this webinar to discuss SB 743 and the vehicle miles traveled metric. Um, I'm gonna be talking more about what 743 is and the corresponding CEQA guideline and what it expressly says. And Kate and Chris have done a very nice job of teeing up um, the discussion for me. Um, so as you all likely know, CEQA analyses had traditionally treated automobile delay and congestion as an environmental impact. And uh, the level of service metric has been commonly used to measure those tra uh, traffic impacts. So Senate Bill 743, as Kate mentioned, which was signed into law in 2013, initiated a major shift in how lead agencies measure transportation impacts under CEQA. And you can find the text of um, SB 743 in Public Resources Code section 21099. So the intent behind SB 743 was twofold. Number one, to ensure that transportation impacts um, such as noise and air quality continue to be adequately addressed in CEQA and number two, to balance the needs of congestion management with the state's goals related to infill, promoting public health through active transportation and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. SB 743 directed OPR to propose an update to the CEQA guidelines, establishing new criteria for transportation analyses that would permit, promote the state's goals. And we know that a number of you have been following this process pretty closely since 2013 and over the years, um, we've gotten many comments and um, helpful, uh, we've had many helpful discussions. So we wanna thank everyone for all of those comments and discussions. Uh, OPR finished its proposal after a lengthy public outreach process that uh, began right after Senate Bill 743 was uh, passed by the governor. Uh, we transmitted that proposal to the Natural Resources Agency who then began and completed a formal rulemaking process and the Natural Resources Agency certified the guidelines uh, amendments in 2018. So importantly, um, Senate Bill 743 said that upon the Secretary of the Natural Resources Agency's certification, automobile delay is no longer a significant environmental impact under CEQA. Um, and I'll come back to that point later as it becomes uh, relevant to to the discussion of how do we proceed um, right now. And Chris has already mentioned that, I, I believe. Uh, Chris, can you uh, go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, what does the corresponding guideline require? 
As a result of the resources agency's rulemaking process, um, these changes were required that were required by 743 were included in section 15064.3 of the CEQA guidelines. So Chris has already talked about some of those provisions, but I'm going to go over all of them at a high level and I've posted them, um, the major points here on this slide. So first, uh, the guideline section says that VMT is the most appropriate metric for determining the significance of transportation impacts under CEQA. So under the new guideline, we are no longer measuring congestion under CEQA and a project's impacts on automobile automobile delay um, is not a significant impact except where provided in the guideline. So instead, CEQA is concerned about the amount and distance of automobile travel attributable to a project. And this is otherwise known as VMT or vehicle miles traveled. So this um, VMT metric is not an entirely new one in CEQA, as you likely know. So VMT is already used in environmental analyses in CEQA to study other potential impacts such as greenhouse gases, air quality, and energy impacts. Um, next, the new guideline includes presumptions for land use and transportation projects. And if a presumption is met, your project may have a less than significant transportation impact. In general, the presumptions apply, or may apply rather, if your project is near transit um, or if it decreases VMT compared to existing conditions. And what I mean by near transit is that the um, projects that are within half a mile of either an existing major transit stop or stop along an existing high quality transit corridor. Um, I saw a question about the presumptions and I'll just note that because this is a presumption, lead agencies still must consider whether any features of the project or its location would tend to negate the presumption. So as a lead agency, um, uh, you'll wanna, or we recommend that um, you support any conclusions with substantial evidence. Um, other things that I wanna go over in the guideline relate to the methodology and the time for implementation. Um, since VMT is already used to analyze impacts for other resource areas, a quantitative estimate may be possible. Um, where there isn't a model or methodology to quantitatively assess VMT, an agency can assess them qualitatively. And one particular area where a qualitative assessment may be appropriate is for construction impacts. Finally, statewide implementation of the guideline must begin by July 1st, 2020. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of that deadline and we'll continue to to mention that a few times during this webinar. So um, that all said, the agencies can use VMT now if they're ready. And as Chris mentioned, we've already seen a number of agencies already implement VMT. And later today, we're going to hear about VMT implementation from one of those agencies, the city of San Jose. And thank you, Chris, for advancing the slides. So um, on this slide, I'll be talking about when, um, when does C the CEQA analysis need to begin using VMT? This is a question that we um, get asked pretty often, particularly among people who are working on documents that may be in pro process. And I think I actually saw a question uh, pop up relating to um, implementation and the July 1st date. So hopefully we can get to that one. Um, so the um, the CEQA guidelines discuss uh, specifically in section 15007 when an agency would need to comply with changes um, to the guidelines such as this VMT metric. Um, amendments to the guidelines apply only prospectively and thus are forward looking. So in other words, the VMT metric applies to steps that you haven't done yet in the CEQA process after July 1st. Um, if your environmental document, such as a draft EIR or draft NEGDAC, is sent out for a public review after July 1st, it must include a VMT analysis. Um, when you send out a document for public review, your document is only required to meet the content requirements that are in effect on that date. And that's also stated in section 15007. If you um, have already certified or adopted your environmental document, before July 1st, 
your document is not required um, to include a VMT analysis. So uh, just to just to illustrate some of the points that I said, um, I want to give some examples, and I know there are probably many many um, slight wrinkles to all of these examples, but these are just some some basic ones. Uh, so first example, let's say your draft neg deck or EIR went out for public review in 2019 at some point. And uh, you think your agency will certify or adopt the document on June 30th. In that case, VMT is not required. Um, as a next example, your draft, uh, let's say your draft neg deck or EIR is going out for public review on June 30th. Um, in that case, um, VMT is also not required, although it is, as I'll talk about later, it is recommended. Um, another example, uh, let's say your draft neg deck or EIR already went out for public review or rather is going to be going out for public review on June 30th. And the final document is going to be certified or adopted after July 1st. Um, in that situation, we interpret the guidelines as saying that the final document um, that gets certified or adopted after July 1st does not need to be revised to include a VMT analysis. And the final example I'll, I'll give is um, that let's say your draft neg deck or EIR is going to be going out for public review on July 2nd. In that case, VMT is, is required. So I think the key question here uh, that agencies and project applicants need to be asking themselves is, when is your document going out for public review? Is it before or after July 1st? Um, so earlier I mentioned that the VMT metric applies prospectively um, as stated in the CEQA guidelines and doesn't require statewide implementation until July 1st. Uh, as Chris mentioned though, some agencies have already adopted and require using the VMT metric for CEQA purposes. Um, an example again is San Jose, where they've adopted it um, by resolution. So if your project is in one of those jurisdictions that have already implemented VMT, then your, anal uh, your environmental analysis would need to use the VMT metric. Um, and my last point on this slide relates to a recent appellate court case discussing SB 743 and the new guideline uh, that you should be aware of. So this case is called um, Citizens for Positive Growth and Preservation versus City of Sacramento. Um, and I've included the citation there in case anybody wants to look deeper into this case. It recently came out in November 2019. This case involved a CEQA challenge to the adequacy of the Sacramento General Plan EIR's LOS analysis. Um, and in that case, the court generally noted that according to SB 743, Upon the resources agency's certification of the guideline in 2018, automobile delay as measured by level of service was no longer a significant impact. But at the same time, statewide imp implementation of EMT is not required until July 1st, 2020. So um, ultimately it is up to the lead agency to decide what metric it's going to use before July 1st. And as Kate mentioned, we do recommend that agencies um, start at least to think about uh, using VMT as uh, the metric in CEQA analyses. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, on my final slide here, um, the question, another common question that we get asked a lot is whether the lead agency has to do anything now, um, between now and July 1st, to use the VMT metric. And um, we also get asked a lot about what is the procedural mechanism they should be using to implement VMT. So I just want to step back and mention that CEQA requires agencies to adopt implementing procedures. And that is, uh, you can find reference to that in the guidelines section 15022. Um, and so these implementing procedures have to be consistent with the CEQA statute and the guidelines. Local implementing procedures should also be updated when new changes to the guidelines come out. Um, agencies can simply incorporate by reference 
the CEQA guidelines and any amendments, including the new VMT guidelines section, um, just wholesale. As to specific VMT thresholds, um, lead agencies can formally adopt thresholds of significance for VMT, such as through an adopted policy resolution or ordinance, um, but doing so is not required to start using the VMT metric. Uh, agencies can just use these, uh, use the VMT metric on a project by project basis. And um, we also do get a lot of questions about how do you square the new metric with general plans, which uh, might still be using the level of service metric. And um, agencies can still use LOS in their general plans um, or other purposes outside of CEQA. Um, so 743 didn't take that ability to use level of service in non sequel contexts away from local agencies. And I do want to just quickly mention, this is not on one of the slides, but I do want to just quickly mention tiering because we know it's a question that has come up a lot among um, agencies and applicants and the general public. So tiering just uh, is a concept that refers to um, when the agency covers a general matter in a broad EIR for, um, and then they leave for a more site-specific analysis, they leave that for a later, more focused EIR or NEGDAC. So uh, this, like I said, the question is, how, how do I deal with um, a subsequent, um, how do I deal with a project that may fall uh, within, within a, a prior EIR, but now we have this new metric. And so uh, we think that whether VMT is going to be covered in a tier document is going to largely be a fact-based inquiry that is going to be guided by the public resources code section 21166 um, and CEQA guidelines 15162 uh, and the related provisions. So this is one topic that we know has a lot of interest we're intending to talk about it later um, in more detail and hopefully with other people um, uh, during our office hours. So see, uh, please stay tuned for that. And that is my last point. So I'm going to hand it back to Chris and it looks like we're going to questions. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, questions, if there are any. Hey, thanks, Chris. Yes, we do have questions. Our top question based on votes is about um, tourism. So how would you do a VMT analysis for remote areas where the economy is based on tourism um, and visitors are coming um, from many different areas to visit local attractions? Great, big question. And I'm sure some of the detail of it we'll need to answer in an, kind of an office hour setting. Um, but essentially, this we'll, we'll, we'll discuss methods um, for uh, residential, for retail, and for office um, projects. And at the end, um, we'll talk a little bit about transportation projects as well. Um, for projects that don't fit in any of those categories, of course, we weren't able to cover um, methods for every single sort of project because there's, you know, all many, many, many types of projects. Um, in, in our technical advisory, we weren't able to, to uh, provide examples for all of them, but we recommend uh, as a general approach, starting with one of the methods that we have um, recommended. And I think it'll be better to go through those methods and then maybe um, take that question a little bit later when we've um, discussed the, the sort of methods um, that we recommend. So we'll, we'll get back to that one some here, but I'm sure there'll be more details and we can follow up. Great, thanks. Um, our next question is about cumulative impacts. So how does OPR recommend addressing cumulative impacts in light of the new VMT approach and what threshold should an agency compare against to determine if a cumulative impact is significant using VMT? You all, you all are advanced. Um, cumulative is something else we're going to get to a little bit later on. Very briefly, um, so not to uh, uh, keep it from you, um, when we use efficiency metrics, by which I mean VMT per capita per something per capita or VMT per employee, um, then those aren't additive like um, uh, you know, a, a, um, a, a just standard metric such as a, a VMT or, you know, any other metric, greenhouse gases, air quality. Um, <clears throat> a per capita metric, 
you know, of course, you don't you don't have a, a development that has 15 VMT per capita, and a second development that has 15 VMT per capita, and you, that doesn't give you 30 VMT per capita. You still have 15 VMT per capita. And the handy thing about that is that if you've done a uh, an analysis with an efficiency metric with a per capita VMT analysis, as we recommend doing for housing. Uh, as I recommend doing um, per employee for office, um, then your you, your uh, project level analysis is also your uh, cumulative analysis. There's not an additional cumulative impact that you have. Um, for projects which we recommend using VMT, um, rather than VMT per capita, we'll talk about those, um, then you may have a cumulative analysis, cumulative impact if and that you should check for, you should analyze for, if you had your project has an increase in BMT. Again, we'll get to that uh, uh, again a little later in the program. Great, thanks, Chris. And since we have a little bit more time, uh, our next top question is about um, what folks should do if their jurisdiction um, has adopted VMT thresholds, but adjacent agencies um, with intersections that would be impacted by the project have not adopted VMT thresholds and continue to assess impacts based on LOS? Um, the uh, first answer is hopefully um, wait a few months and that problem will be um, solved as everybody's going to VMT. I would, uh, I would see whether um, Jeannie or even Natalie, if you have an answer to that question, um, I, it probably comes down to a legal nuance within CEQA. I also know that San Jose has been addressing exactly that issue and they're going to be on talking later so they can they can talk about how they've done it. I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for you myself right now. And I'm just wondering if the question is coming from a technical aspect though, are we? Um... Right, okay, I can talk a little bit about that. So a project within, let me, I'll describe the technical side of it at least. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, uh, so VMT, uh, and I'll talk about this later on as well, needs to be looked at through the full trip, um, including any portions of it in a neighboring jurisdiction that does go outside of your jurisdiction. So, um, but the mitigation, you if, you, if you're um, doing any mitigation on the project, uh, the mitigation is generally done, and there's exceptions this we'll also talk about later, but the mitigation is generally done at the project site. Or that's the first, the first place to look in any case, the simplest place. Um, so unlike LOS, you're not doing um, intersection improvements in a neighboring jurisdiction. You are instead doing things within your jurisdiction to reduce the amount of traffic you're loading into their jurisdiction. So that's a key uh, uh, distinguishing uh, difference, the difference between um, LOS and um, where we're going, VMT. And uh, I'll just also note that on a previous webinar, um, we did get a question about um, whether you have to look at impacts that, um, of, um, impacts that are outside of the state. And the answer is um, yes, just because CEQA requires you to look at um, all the direct and indirect impacts. But as Chris just mentioned, um, the on the mitigation side, it's um, it can be dealt with um, on your project site or area. Great, thanks, guys. Um, our next top question is about um, how you apply VMT to non-residential or commercial projects. Um, for example, how do you recommend um, conducting a transportation analysis for projects such as waste management projects, landfills, recycling, recycling facilities, et cetera. Yeah, and sorry, I'm having a little bit of technical trouble. My picture just disappeared and I can't figure out how to get it back. Maybe over here, give me one sec. Um, no, huh. you may have to just look at my slides. Um, okay, so a recycling uh, or similar facility Oh, here we go. Thank you, Beth. Um, uh, a recycling uh, or, or similar facility, um, uh, that sort of industrial, again, isn't covered directly by our, um, our guidance, um, but there are some, some uh, um, uh, ask, so there are some notes in our technical advisory that are important. First, and this is another one we'll talk about a little bit later on, 
uh, the definition of the vehicles that we're looking at, the VMT, the vehicles whose VMT we're, we're studying under 743 are generally speaking passenger vehicles. Um, and so, for example, um, garbage trucks or recycling trucks that are going um, to these facilities, um, you wouldn't need to count that VMT towards your VMT. You, uh, you would probably consider employee commute VMT. Um, so, um, so that's probably the most important um, piece of the answer to that question. Um, from there, it's just a matter of um, what the travel activity is like um, what sort of travel does that, um, what sort of uh, travel patterns does that facility draw? If it's most like a, an office, uh, you might look at VMT per employee. Um, uh, in many cases, industrial, the, the auto travel to them is, is similar to, um, to uh, office, but um, of course you, you'd likely use a different threshold because um, uh, they're not comparable land uses, so you wouldn't expect um, to hit the same um, uh, um, thresholds. Uh, you wouldn't expect to use the same significance thresholds as with office projects. So that's a that's a partial answer. We'll we'll get into some of that later too, with um, a few a few different ways um, in the remaining sections. Okay. Well, that takes us to about three o'clock. So let's move on to our next segment. Terrific. Thank you, Natalie. Okay, the next uh, section is how to assess VMT relevant to a number of the questions. Um, we'll be continuing on to that too, how to make significance determinations or recommendations on that. Um, <clears throat> so uh, these are recommendations from our technical advisory. Again, that technical advisory um, has been years in the making. It's built on substantial evidence. We have studied quite a bit of um, academic research um, and they're also the product of uh, several years of consensus building, um, numerous, numerous expert convenings and expert consultations, um, uh, more panel discussions than I'd like to admit that I've uh, been a part of. We counted them up and, and all these together were over 200 and that was a couple of years ago. Um, uh, so this, this um, these recommendations are probably the most detailed that CEQA has ever seen on a metric of um, impact. And, um, and I'll also mention that they've been, uh, the major recommendations, the, 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 um, uh, besides some of the details, the major recommendations have basically been in place um, since 2016 or so. There were a few significant adjustments before that, but they've really settled in and we're not expecting uh, even though this is a living, the technical advisory is a living document and will take new evidence as we see it and, and fold it in for everyone's use, new uh, substantial evidence uh, as we can provide it, um, but we're not expecting any of the fundamental recommendations to change a whole lot. So what's, what's in there? What do we recommend? Um, first, I talked through this already, so I'll be brief here. Uh, the CEQA guidelines actually tell us that VMT is the amount and distance of automobile travel attributable to a project. And we clarify a little further in the technical advisory that by automobile, uh, that means on-road passenger vehicles, uh, specifically cars and, and light trucks, SUVs. Um, so you can include in your modeling a heavy duty truck VMT um, for convenience of calculation if, that, if those numbers are lumped together in the data you have, for example. Um, but there's not a need under 743 to examine heavy duty truck VMT um, uh, itself. For residential and office projects, we recommend a tour or trip based analysis. These um, projects generate and attract in the in the terminology of transportation planning and transportation engineering. Um, uh, residential uh, generates trips and um, and uh, other uses attract the trips. Um, attract trips, but in any case, we recommend thinking through this frame. Uh, when now analyzing uh, the vehicle travel from residential and office projects. And what we mean by uh, trip and tour base, let's start with tour base. These are the kind of more, the newer, more sophisticated models many of the larger MPOs have in place and some of the smaller ones too, actually. Um, I wanna just give an example here. So uh, starting, someone starts at the household, uh, stops by Starbucks on their way to work, um, at lunchtime drives out to lunch and back again, where, trips one through four now, and then trip five uh, drives back home. 
uh, and then in the evening goes out for a shopping trip, uh, six and seven and back home again. All, uh, all these trips are, are organized from a travel, uh, from a uh, tour based model. Um, sometimes, uh, usually they're the same thing as what's called activity based models um, into tours. Tours always begin and end at home. <clears throat> So uh, here we have a work tour. This, this person had a work tour and a shopping tour in the course of their day. Now together, all that vehicle travel that's, that's from that house uh, is called household VMT. So when we say household VMT, that's what we mean. All the vehicle travel uh, attributable to a household. Let's compare that to the trip-based models, uh, which see things a little bit more simply. These are the older models, but still in place in a lot of places. Um, and they're fine to use for 743. So another example, you start uh, at your home, uh, make a trip out to work and then back again, I guess you brought your lunch today. And uh, then in the evening, stop for a snack, head out and stop for a snack, uh, do some shopping and trip number five back home again, all right? So the trip-based model sees this a little differently. It sees all these trips, one, two, three, and five as home-based VMT because they have one end of the trip at home and it sees trip four as non-home-based VMT and it can't see that trip four is connected to this household. Those models just don't have that capacity. Nevertheless, using home-based VMT is fine too. You just need to make sure you're using home-based VMT when you set your thresholds and home-based VMT when you do your assessment. So there's apples to apples. I'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a few slides. So again, we recommend, and I have page numbers here so you can refer to the technical advisory and take a look at um, exactly how we um, made the recommendation in writing. But for residential, um, we, we again recommend you use either home-based VMT, that trip-based VMT, or household VMT, uh, tour-based. Um, and we recommend you use the metric VMT per capita. Um, in California, we have a proud tradition of accommodating people from all over the planet. And we're not looking, CEQA is not a tool to limit growth. Um, and it's not a, a it's clearly not a good, in a, in a housing crisis, um, uh, reasonable policy to uh, limit growth. Uh, what our goal is and what CEQA's goal is, is to reduce environmental impact of growth or report it out first and when needs mitigation to reduce it. Um, so residential developments add population. We get new vehicle travel when we put a house there. It generates vehicle travel. Um, we put an office development, an employee, it accommodates an employee and that um, attracts uh, a, new <clears throat> a new person to the, to the region, um, <clears throat> to the area. And, um, and then so we look using uh, VMT per capita for residential um, uh, at, at the efficiency, the transportation efficiency of that um, development. And uh, this use of an efficiency metric is um, recommended in case law. Um, <clears throat> there's another important feature to it, which is that this approach allows significance determinations to be crosswalked with greenhouse gas targets in state law. So um, using this method and then using the significance thresholds that we'll um, set forth a little later, and also from the technical advisory, and we'll, we'll talk through them in the next section, um, allow you to demonstrate that your uh, project is going to be consistent with state greenhouse gas emissions reduction law, um, <clears throat> or that you've mitigated it to do so, or uh, acknowledge that you have any right statement of overhead considerations. Very similarly for office, um, we recommend either trip or tour-based uh, approach. Um, and we recommend also that for if you're using a tour-based approach, you might use just the work tour, but you might use full household VMT assigned to the workplace because the uh, work location has such a large effect on travel behavior as a whole. Um, it, it can make sense to use the full employee's VMT. So either of those uh, works and the metric we recommend is VMT per employee. Again, office developments add population. We're not trying to limit development. What we're trying to do is examine its transportation efficiency. Um, and uh, again, this approach um, can be crosstalk with state greenhouse gas emissions reduction law. For retail projects, we recommend a different approach. Retail uh, development does not generate uh, VMT. 
it uh, reroutes VMT. People don't start shopping when you plonk a store onto a lot. Uh, they reroute their shopping travel um, to go to that store. Um, so for that reason, we recommend looking at net VMT or total VMT. Those are different words for the same thing. You look at the VMT, um, ambient VMT, and then <clears throat> look at the VMT that um, uh, with the project, uh, the, the, again, the ambient VMT with the project, the existing ambient VMT and the ambient VMT with the project. And uh, if the project reduces VMT, um, as we'll uh, go into later on, you have a less than significant impact. Um, uh, neighborhood serving retail, the local serving retail is uh, very, very likely to have a, uh, to reduce VMT and therefore we recommend presuming it less than significant. For a mixed use project, we recommend, we recommend analyzing each use separately. This is on page six of the technical advisory. Um, and the reason for that is if you mush the land uses together and analyze them together, you lose connection in the analysis to environmental goals. So any two land uses or more, um, some of them will be inherently more travel efficient than the other. And so uh, whether if you lump them together, whether you hit, uh, whether you achieve significance or uh, have a less than significant result or a significant result, significant impact, uh, will depend on the mix of, project, of, pro of uh, land use types within the project rather than on the environmental performance of the project. And it's important in a CEQA document in an, an impact analysis that you're focused on the environmental impact of uh, the, the project and able to crosswalk that impact to state goals and um, <clears throat> separating the uses and analyzing each independently um, uh, provides you that opportunity. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about thresholds of significance, um, but I'll just come back to that we um, it's a key point that you need to use the same method, um, for example, a trip-based method or a tour-based method um, for threshold determination, project assessment, and project mitigation. Those all have to be apples to apples, and you can see more details, uh, read more details about that on page 13, pages 13 and 30 of the technical advisory. It's also important that you fully count the vehicle travel coming out of your project as um, truncating it uh, causes a, a set of problems. I'm gonna go through those briefly so you know why it's important to look at the full extent of the vehicle travel. So truncation leads to a biased assessment. Um, first, it undercounts the VMT of projects closer to the edge of your model um, or whatever assessment you're using that, that's causing the truncating. Second, it undercounts uh, projects with longer trips. And third, it causes underestimation of the threshold of significance, which uh, among other things, limits infill streamlining. Um, it, it, make, it shrinks those green zones. You get less streamlining, um, uh, le a less broad streamlined area. Um, and altogether though, that truncation creates a permissive bias, tends to create a permissive bias for outlying development or restrictive bias for infill. So we really recommend, um, and, and uh, under CEQA, the, the rule of reason um, also requires you to look at the full extent of the impact. <clears throat> there has been a tradition in climate action planning and inventorying to divvy trips 50-50 between jurisdictions. And that unfortunately has the same problem in the CEQA context. Um, it, it's, it's a useful tool in, in uh, the inventory process, but in the CEQA context, that leads to all these same three problems uh, again. Um, undercounting of EMT of edge projects, undercounting projects with longer trips, and, and underestimation of the threshold limiting of infill streamlining. So we recommend not using this approach. In CEQA, you're comparing your full vehicle trip to a threshold based on full vehicle trips. So that apples to apples, that need for an apples to apples comparison, um, again, requires you to look at full trips. So there's a, a, a couple reasons you need to look at full trips, um, rule of reason, and uh, and as I just mentioned. So if you're doing, if you're assessing VMT and you find that there, that some of the VMT is outside of your area of assessment, simply increase your area of assessment. And this can um, be uh, through sophisticated means. Say COG is in the process, um, the Sacramento area COG is in the process of developing a, a modeling approach to um, incorporate these external trips. 
Um, but also in um, cases where there's not the resources or until you get some uh, more sophisticated approach in place, um, the, the approach might look like counting, looking at the vehicle volume that you're expecting to see at the edge of the, the model at the, um, the gate and <clears throat> making an assumption, for example, maybe that, VM, maybe that vehicle travel is likely to be going to a town or a city uh, five miles beyond the boundary. So you can just take that volume and multiply by the likely distance and get um, a best assessment uh, uh, of the additional VMT. That needs to just be incorporated into your overall VMT analysis. So we'll stop there and I'll take some questions on that material. Great, thanks Chris. Um, so our top question is about how to utilize the VMT metric um, in rural areas um, that are less likely to be centered around urban nodes. All right, another um, big question, um, just because there's so many types of rural areas in our state. There's you know, destination recreation, there's um, agriculture and, and other sorts of um, uh, productive land. Uh, there are you know, farm worker communities, there are small towns. Um, so it's difficult to answer um, generally, but <clears throat> essentially the same uh, way that you look at VMT elsewhere. Um, with, um, and we'll talk about this in the next section, but just a, a little preview, um, that we do recommend in rural counties, not in PO counties, that um, uh, the, the thresholds that, of significance that we're about to talk through that we recommend, we're recommending in those, in those rural counties, uh, um, developing those on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, I'll talk more about those um, uh, as we walk through them. But assessment, uh, the, the um, tools you use for assessment can be as sophisticated as a, a large travel map model or as simple as a um, spreadsheet calculation um, relying on research or in between a statistical model, um, which is a, a fancy name for um, something like CaliMod that we're all using today for, or we have been using for years for, for air quality. Um, there's also jurisdictions that have developed their own models, and you could easily imagine um, rural areas um, banding together and developing a, a generalized model um, over over larger regions. So um, there's there's partial answers. I know there's a lot more, and, and I, I want to give the question the question the um, the question or the opportunity to uh, maybe um, we can dig into that more in office hours, or if there's more questions after the next section. Great, thanks, Chris. Our next top question is, um, can you address the relationship, if any, between SB 743 and a regional transportation plan? For example, can you use assumptions from the RTP to establish baseline measures? Generally in CEQA, you are using existing conditions as your baseline. Um, I don't know if I was headed, uh, slated to talk today about it, but for a transportation project, um, it's likely to make sense to use a future um, baseline looking with and without the project to eliminate other factors, um, uh, background factors, to just look at the effects of the project. Um, and we'll be developing some additional guidance on that. But just for now, um, uh, know that that's a, an, um, a, a less usual approach, but one that we're going to be recommending for um, transportation projects. Um, the regional transportation plan itself needs to undergo a VMT analysis. Um, unfortunately, at the current, uh, uh, currently, um, there isn't a regional transportation plan in the state under SB 375 that's, they're achieving their 375 targets, but, but there aren't any that are achieving the um, full, uh, fully needed emissions reduction to be consistent with um, state climate goals as articulated in the scoping plan. So there isn't a kind of a wholesale um, uh, either on the land use or um, uh, transportation project side, uh, a full scale sort of tiering that can be done. Although we do hope to um, see that in the future to, to um, make uh, these analyses even more efficient. And uh, Chris, I just wanted to jump in onto that first question and just point out to people that in CEQA guidelines section 15064.3 um, subdivision B2, it, uh, the very last sentence of B2 talks about um, tiering and it just says that to the extent that such impacts have already been adequately addressed at a programmatic level, such as in a regional transportation plan EIR, a lead agency may tier 
from that analysis as provided for in section 15152. So there's, um, there's some information there too, if you're not already aware of it. Thanks, Jeannie. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, we have time for another question and Jeannie, I believe this one is for you. So within CEQA Appendix G, uh, the first initial study checklist question under transportation asks if your project will be consistent with any plan addressing the circulation system, such as the general plan. So if the general plan still identifies LOS thresholds, uh, doesn't that require an LOS analysis be performed for the project? Uh, thanks for that question. So. Um, generally, CEQA, as we all know, is focused on um, planning inconsistencies that lead to environmental impacts. Um, so using LOS in a general plan doesn't mean that you have to use an LOS analysis required under um, CEQA because automobile delay as measured by LOS is no longer an environmental impact, but a local agency could still look at LOS outside of CEQA and um, congestion-based impacts impacts could still be required as conditions of approval on the project, but it just cannot be, um, LOS-based mitigation cannot be CEQA mitigation. And I'll add a little bit to that one. So um, there, there are some of the jurisdictions that have um, made the switch to VMT have continued to use LOS, but in a much more limited way, generally to look at the function of the intersection adjacent to the project rather than a whole set of um, intersections uh, around the project. We've heard, you know, one to 5% of the, the, um, the kind of effort of a, um, uh, of uh, the, the kind of the number of intersections and, and the analytical effort um, uh, for their their new LOS approach on LOS analyses, the very contained areas, and um, <clears throat> we recommend uh, we recommend uh, avoiding uh, not uh, although it's not disallowed by 743, uh, we recommend not doing LOS analyses um, uh, at the scale. Um, and, 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 and as we have done under CEQA for all the reasons that we, we talked about at the outset, um, that the, not the least of which is that uh, it doesn't ultimately help you for um, solving transportation problems. It actually ends up hurting those. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, those, those recommendations are contained in the general plan guidelines. Uh, we recommend um, using ultimately metrics of, auto, of accessibility, how easy it is for people to get two places rather than um, through intersections um, as metric as planning metrics, and then again, uh, of course, VMT is a metric of impact under CEQA. Great, thanks, Chris. I think that takes us to our next section. Great, thank you. Okay, determining significance. So, just to step back, a general um, general uh, uh, how CEQA works slide. Um, <clears throat> so a project can be uh, essentially one of three types. It can do, be divided in this in this way. Um, you can have a project that doesn't create an impact. In this case, we're talking VMT. So a project that's a low VMT project just inherently. Um, and we've recommended, we've talked through different approaches for this, streamlining those kinds of projects. Um, there's a second kind of project which will uh, create, uh, will generate sufficient VMT to create a significant impact but with mitigation can be reduced to a less than significant impact. So um, there uh, you reduce the MT with mitigation and you're less than significant, go forward. Um, the third type of project has higher VMT and um, some mitigation may be feasible, mitigates the VMT as feasible, uh, but VMT uh, remains significant. It, it can't be mitigated to less than significant feasibly. And that sort of project can proceed with a statement of overriding considerations. Um, so, in order to achieve this array of goals we have in the state around environment, health, but also transportation, um, economy, uh, we're going to need more uh, you know, housing goals, uh, certainly near the top of that list. We're going to need more streamlined projects. We're gonna to need to build more of these and the streamlining will help. Um, and we're going to need the VMT reduction that we'll achieve from the mitigation of the uh, projects type two and three. In our technical advisory, we make note, and I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier on, that we need to be doing VMT reduction now as we're developing. It isn't something that as we need to get to zero carbon around the middle of the, the century, 
uh, we can go back and retrofit or, or fix or, um, or recover from, we actually need to be doing the VMT reduction work uh, now. Again, we can't go back and move that development towards the center of the city. We can't um, re-fix the street network so you don't have to drive around in loops and lollipops to get to the store. Um, uh, that has to be done now as we're doing development. So um, that's one of the reasons why um, the VMT mitigation is so important, even for just for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but but um, in addition to greenhouse gas or, or in conjunction with greenhouse gas mitigation, um, much less for all the other interests. Um, and the California Air Resources Board has done the modeling and the math to um, assess how much VMT we need to reduce by compared to, compared to where we are now. Um, how much more, let me put that a little more um, uh, precisely, how much more um, travel efficient will need projects to be in the future compared to how they are now. And the simple uh, quick answer is about 15%. We'll need to be, new projects will need to be about 15% more travel efficient than existing projects in order for us to hit our 2030 and beyond uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, targets in law. And uh, this probably goes without saying, but I will say it anyways, um, inconsistency with state greenhouse gas emissions reduction law could be considered to constitute a significant environmental impact. For this reason, uh, we recommend, um, so there's, there's an array of impacts connected to VMT. Greenhouse gases is just one of them. We've talked through health impacts, other environmental impacts, um, but greenhouse gases have very clear and specific quantitative goals. Uh, we have them enshrined in law. Um, so it's important to look at those and we recommend basing thresholds um, uh, on state climate goals. And again, California Resources Board has done the crosswalking work and they found that 15% below existing for projects that generate new trips, and that's, uh, for example, residential and office projects, 15% uh, below existing uh, is the level at which you're consistent with state climate goals. So to put a little finer point on it for residential, and this is on page uh, 15, 16 of our technical advisory, um, we recommend using the trip or tour, a trip or tour based approach uh, that we went through just a little bit ago in the last section. Um, count your trips fully. We also went through that. Um, and use a threshold of 15% below regional or city VMT per capita. Um, so uh, using those geographies, it, it, it's, um, there, there may be a temptation to draw your own geography. And the concern there is uh, it would be easy to draw a geography, just intentionally capture high VMT areas and uh, raise your significance threshold. In doing so, you lose connection to state climate goals. So you really, um, <clears throat> it's important to use your jurisdiction uh, and or your region. And um, uh, looking, we recommend um, using the more permissive of those thresholds, although um, some cities have gone ahead and, and um, used a more environmentally protective threshold, um, which is also explicitly allowed. Um, for office development, again, trip or tour based approach, uh, count full trips, don't truncate, and um, use a threshold of 15% below regional VMT per employee. Um, and we focus on the regional geography for office because frequently commute trips to office um, are, they tend to be the longest trips of your day. And um, those um, <clears throat> tend to cross city boundaries often. For retail, uh, we already discussed, and it's again on page 16, 17, the technical advisory, um, our recommendation to use net VMT or total VMT, different words for the same thing. Uh, we've already talked that, uh, um, shared that we recommend locally serving retail, presume less than significant, and then retail that, that tends to lead to more shopping. So it reroutes people's shopping patterns to require more driving. Um, that might, be, a, that might uh, be called a significant impact. For mixed use development, here we're on page 17 of the technical advisory, uh, we recommend considering each use separately or focusing on the predominant use. Again, not mushing uses together, uh, which loses you connection to um, environmental outcomes. Um, comparing to the relevant threshold, so uh, the residential component of a project, comparing that to the residential threshold we recommend, uh, retail to the retail threshold we recommended. Um, do take credit for internal capture. So in this project that's in the background here, 
uh, the, there would be trips likely from the upstairs residences to the downstairs coffee shop or other, uh, other shops. Um, and those obviously, um, uh, they're included in the people per capita, um, but they're not included, they're not, there's not any additional VMT. So those would help lower your VMT. You want to get credit for those, um, even as you look at the, the uses uh, individually. And, you know, projects like this are very likely to just be wholesale streamlined because, um, for example, the residential might be affordable. That would itself lead to streaming. It might be within a half mile of transit that would itself um, uh, offer streamlining, or it might be in a low VMT area. So it's a project, this type of project often is, um, again, uh, streamlined. Uh, similarly, the retail uh, on the bottom floor of these projects is very likely going to be local serving rather than retail, rather than regional serving retail. Um, so it's presumed less than significant. So most of these sorts of projects uh, won't even need to do any VMT analysis at all. A redevelopment project, by which I mean a project that's going where there was something else before. Uh, we cover this on pages 17 and 18. Um, <clears throat> if the new project leads to a reduction in overall vehicle travel, then we recommend a less than significant um, impact, <clears throat> finding, a, uh, less than, uh, finding a less than significant impact. If the project increases vehicle travel, um, then we recommend applying the thresholds that we uh, just described uh, for each um, land use as, as we described it. So ignore the, in that case, ignore the land use that was there and just look at the vehicle travel um, generated by attracted to or associated with the development you're, you're adding. <clears throat> There's a caution here though, if you are replacing uh, affordable residential with a fewer number of market rate units, it's gonna be important for you to look at the full VMT effects that include the VMT the increase, the potential increased VMT of those displaced residents. Again, more on this page 17 and 18 of our technical advisory. For plans, we recommend applying the project level thresholds um, to the plan. For example, looking at the aggregate of the residential development in the plan and comparing that to the 15% below regional or city average uh, we recommend. Same for uh, office and then another uh, uh, pass for um, <clears throat> uh, retail or other land uses. And we already talked about cumulative impacts um, for an efficiency metric like VMT per capita, VMT per employee. Um, a less than significant project impact means you also have a less than significant cumulative impact. Um, but for projects that use total VMT, um, cumulative analysis may be appropriate. So uh, a region serving retail that happens to increase VMT, not all region serving retail does, but some may, um, uh, that might wanna do a cumulative analysis with other similar um, uh, um, development that's, that may add um, vehicle travel. <clears throat> For rural development, I already talked about this a little bit as well. Uh, we recognize that there are a large array in the state of rural contexts and a large array of rural project types um, that vary in those contexts. And so we recommend choosing a threshold on a case-by-case -case basis, um, considering the context your project is going into. So the CEQA guidelines are explicit that you may use a, um, I'll just read it directly from the guidelines, a lead agency may consider thresholds of significance previously adopted or recommended by other public agencies or recommended by experts, provided uh, substantial evidence backs those, um, uh, those uh, approaches, those um, significance, thresholds of significance. Um, so we have endeavored to provide substantial evidence and lay out clear methods um, that are connected to quantitative environmental goals uh, within the state. Um, and so th there's just an explicit recommendation that those may be used by your, your jurisdiction. Um, you may be one of the jurisdictions who is ahead and doing a lot of their own work and gathering substantial evidence. Uh, you may be one of those jurisdictions that would like prefer to just use our recommendations. Um, you can do that. The CEQA guidelines are explicit about it. Meanwhile, compliance with a threshold that you um, uh, develop, um, particularly if you develop a threshold willy-nilly without substantial evidence, 
does not relieve a lead agency of the obligation to consider substantial evidence indicating that the project's environmental effects may still be significant. So um, if you come up with a threshold willy-nilly, um, someone could use substantial evidence, including the substantial evidence that we've put forth um, and uh, indicate that, that uh, the uh, effect on the, the um, impact of that project is in fact significant. I'll stop there for um, a few minutes of questions. Hey, Chris. Um, so our first question is about something that Jeannie said earlier, um, the ability to use a quantitative analysis for the construction impacts um, or the construction part of a project, um, specifically a utility maintenance or upgrade project um, that has no operational transportation impacts at all, um, according to this attendee, um, they've been asked to prepare a VMT analysis for projects like this. Um, and so they were wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, so two things about construction projects. Um, one, they're often um, mostly heavy duty vehicle travel, which we recommend not considering uh, with VMT. Of course, you would look at the air quality effects um, as you, there wouldn't necessarily be a change in the, the way you do that. Um, and, and other environmental impacts, perhaps. Um, we do recommend um, um, fairly prominently that construction impacts would oftentimes be best assessed with a qualitative analysis. Um, so that's the other point I wanna make about um, construction projects. Okay, great. Um, so our next top question is, um, whether OPR has any guidance to estimate traffic volumes or new traffic counts um, that will be reduced due to the COVID-19 stay at home order, um, since the economy and traffic activity will presumably be impacted in the near and long-term future. Sure, we, uh, yeah, it certainly is and will be impacted in the near term. Longer term is a little bit unclear. Um, we don't know what the future holds. Um, uh, for travel behavior, although there's a lot of reason to think it may be similar to how it was um, before. Um, <clears throat> but this gets to the question of uh, baseline in CEQA. And we, do, um, we don't recommend using an unusual period of time for your baseline, such as the current moment, the present moment. Um, uh, it's not going to um, provide a... a um, a, a useful um, baseline for analysis. So but you wanna use more typical times um, that we're again, likely to return to. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll mention too that when uh, we're developing the VMT, when, when the VMT streamlining maps are developed, um, of course, VMT changes uh, with uh, a very, uh, various factors. Um, including, uh, you know, right now it was very clear the economy and restrictions on on uh, on traveling about. Um, but generally, the economy we saw VMT decrease substantially in the last um, great the so-called Great Recession. Um, however, the relative uh, VMT, so the percent of uh, of regional average of a certain development, is unlikely to change much, even through those perturbations. The thing that changes that is shifts in the urban fabric and shifts in the urban fabric come slowly. We see development in a, in a really hot real estate year of maybe 2% additional housing stock uh, per year in a region. Um, so those, those will remain pretty steady um, through um, um, uh, times, uh, whether different sorts of, of times economically. And uh, Chris, I'll just add, uh, something what you already said, uh, you talked about the baseline. And so um, under the baseline cases and uh, CEQA, basically you can look at historical conditions, um, especially where conditions um, fluctuate. So that might, we might be seeing that more in the future. We don't know, um, but it is important to, for the agencies to make sure that they support uh, whatever baseline they pick with substantial evidence. Jeannie. Let's take another question or a couple, and then I see that Mia is on the line and we can go to her. Okay. Um, so our last question for this section, um, at the plan and program level, what is the appropriate metric for retail? It's not possible to isolate retail VMT, especially in a tour-based model, and total VMT will always have a net increase given the planned growth. 
So would it be appropriate to just analyze resident and employee VMT at the plan level, but not retail? Wait, can you read the last part of that question again, Natalie? Sorry. So no problem. Um, would it be appropriate to just analyze resident and employee VMT at the plan level, but not retail based at VMT? Plan level, right. This is one I might have to chew on a little bit. We may have to come back to it in an office hour setting or in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Um, so I, I think if, if I have it right, Natalie, it's the, the, the um, attendee is asking about plan level analysis and looking at uh, different, um, <clears throat> different land uses within and our recommendation to look individually at land uses. So <laughs> I think it's certainly important to look at, um, uh, it's certainly important to look at the um, uh, residential and compared to the residential threshold office, compared to the office threshold. And I'm talking off the cuff now, so I'll wanna think about it a little bit more, but my thinking is that you would be able to look at the effect of retail um, by um, leaving it out and adding it in um, and seeing what the travel demand model says. I mean, there's all the issues around needing um, a, a well-calibrated travel demand model and such, um, but as far as uh, region, serving, re, region serving retail, um, that's my off the cuff thought about how it might be looked at and at the plan level. But I'm happy to have that questioner circle back to me um, uh, to, for a follow-up discussion. Thanks for, the, thanks for the question. All right, sounds good. That takes us to about 3.40 um, in time for Mia's presentation. Perfect, thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Mia. Great. Chris, do you want to put up the slides? Okay, I think we have the first slide up. Uh, Chris asked me to join the group today to talk a little bit about infill housing and what might be possible going forward, looking at SB 743 as part of the new um, landscape when it comes to examining impacts. Uh, I wanted to go through a project that I completed a couple years ago in Placer County in an area called Kings Beach, which is a rural community that is unincorporated. Uh, so why don't we go to the next slide. So we embarked on a workforce housing project in an area that was unincorporated that had a lot of jobs but not a lot of workforce housing. The majority of the workforce in this area commuted about 120 miles a day. Oftentimes to afford housing, folks lived in Reno, Nevada, other parts of Nevada or even below the snow line and would commute in for um, their work, mostly in the service economy, tourism, restaurants, construction. Uh, if you wanted to live in the basin area, which is, this is what it's considered. Uh, you fall into a watershed and you're governed by both the local jurisdiction, which is Placer County and the TRPA, uh, Tahoe Regional Planning Authority. And so with that, it was a very complicated set of entitlements. At the time we started, we had, it was not the different world and there were two different community plans. There were a multitude of things that did not line up and we had to do a lot of analysis and a lot of changing of the code to allow these projects to move forward. But we were able to secure six different sites in town that were all redevelopment projects um, with the exception of a couple small vacant pieces of land that were underutilized. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to use the same entitlement processes for all of the sites. Each one required something different, but we were able to solve by um, coming up with some interesting prototypes. But before we started, the housing that existed and much of it still exists today looked like this. Next slide. So these were actually units that we took down on the sites that you just saw. These were actually occupied, believe it or not. Uh, down below, I remember the rents in those brown buildings, they were about $900 a, a month and the unit sizes were about 267 square feet. No, uh, no closets, no real kitchens. Um, it, was, it was tight living and this is where people live to have jobs in the area. 
Uh, so we tried to go in and address that differently. Next slide. So we came up with a prototype that could fit on all the different sites that were about 30 units to the acre. We started out at seven units to the acre. We had to reduce parking also, which they wanted two and a half parking spaces per unit, regardless of unit size. We were able to get all the sites approved at 1.2 units. We had to study traffic impacts. We had to do um, very intensive environmental studies and we did not, and we did have to look at LOS and we did have the risk of being sued through our process because we were impacting traffic and we were increasing BMTs based on what was there before. But fortunately, uh, we were able to get approved and, and build the project and completed this, uh, I think it was about 2012. Next slide. We have one, uh, yeah. So we ended up with one large building that accommodated um, the community room and the manager's office. This also has the first um, structured parking garage within the entire community. It also has water quality and a lot of other um, best management practices that were put in place that were unusual because it was Tahoe. But I think that the sort of long story short is projects like this going forward have more certainty to get approved in rural areas because of SB 743 and some of its streamlining incentives that are offered for affordable housing. So instead of studying all the impacts under the LOS model, we're actually able to be exempt or rather we don't have to do the VMT analysis for projects that are 100% affordable, of which all of these are. Also, all of these sites are near transit. And we parked this at, again, at about 1.3 per unit. And we did find when we opened the project that not everyone had a car and that the majority of people left their cars at home and took transit or bike to work. So we found that people's commuting patterns were different if you can provide housing near where people worked. And um, it was really a success story. So a number of the residents, um, it's hard to get in. There's a three-year waiting list and it's, it's really well served to show folks that density can be done in a rural setting that fits within the context of the area. And that also um, has more benefits than impacts. But again, uh, rural affordable housing will be made simpler from the entitlement process through SB 743 because of some of the streamlining available. So we're looking forward to seeing how that uh, progresses into the future. We are looking at a few sites now that's gonna be utilizing that aspect and that will take um, that uncertainty off the table. So we are looking forward to seeing how this is unveiled. Um, again, these are 100% affordable rents from about 30 to 60%. And I could take a question if people have any. Right. Thanks, Mia. Um, we did have a question about affordable housing projects and parking. Um, the city of La Habra said that um, affordable low income uh, projects are where they have the biggest parking issues. And how is BMT going to help with this? And um, it seems like something that might be relevant to your projects as well. Oh, that's such a great question. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, I've heard that before. Um, <clears throat> I think some of it is perception. What we find in our properties is that oftentimes there are, because of the, the nature of being a low income family, it's, it's often, um, if, if they have other means to transit, if they're not absolutely out there where the only way they can get around is a car, people will use the bus, people will walk, they'll take, um, they'll take their bikes if they're in walkable communities. So it really matters on where you place the housing. So. We have seen in all of our properties, fewer cars are owned by households if the housing is near transit and you have an alternative to just driving your car. So I think that's really key location efficiency. Um, and I think the reality is if you allow for multiple parking spaces, you know, two or three parking spaces per unit, quite honestly, people will fill those. You will have people with a lot of cars. But if they choose to move into a housing where there is, is just regulated one parking space per unit, people will move in and either give up that second car or find another place for that car. So really you find that because of its location and its efficiency to other forms of transportation, people, low income families will own fewer cars. So again, that, that we, we have studies, um, I think it was um, 
Transform did a nice study a couple years ago looking at the amount of unused parking associated with affordable housing built in California. And the utilization rate was, I believe, from that study, might have been like 60%. So that means roughly 40% is, is, is not being used. So I think in many cases, there's been a sort of history of requiring that affordable housing or apartments have you know, more than their share, or more than what's needed in parking. And that really just becomes more of the default rather than the reality. Again, if you place new housing near transit and walkable areas, people will have other opportunities to reduce their transportation costs and reduce their vehicle miles traveled by not owning additional cars. And I think we'll see more of that in the future. Thanks, Mia. Um, we have had some questions about um, areas that mainly serve tourists. Uh, so since you came to talk to us about Tahoe, um, I'm hoping you'll also be able to help answer these questions as well. And um, feel free to punt some to Chris as well if they get too technical. But we've had a lot of questions about um, like hotel projects um, and ways to reduce VMT for a hotel project. So do you think it'd be similar to the experiences you've had with housing projects in terms of reducing the parking or focusing on location efficiency? Yeah, I think location efficiency, again, is important. I know because of my work in Lake Tahoe, I know they're really also looking at various shuttles and maybe uh, if you're part of a community that has um, maybe a, a, an innovative transit system, I think that also really helps with the, the tourism. For example, if you could park your cars in one, in one area and then people are gonna be shuttled or walking from various you know, tourist point to tourist point, I think that also helps. So I think you really have to be part of a strategy to help reduce some of those VMTs, especially if you know, you're an area that you can kind of have the walking aspects to it. I think if you're out in, you know, out in the mountains and there's not a lot to walk to, I think that becomes challenging. So I think it's really about your strategic, where are you planning your, your, you know, your tourist units, your hotels, and making sure they're in walkable communities, just like you would, you know, a good infill workforce housing affordable project. Great, thanks so much, Mia. Um, I think that is all we have for today. So thanks so much for coming and joining us for uh, the second time. We really appreciate your time today. My pleasure. Thanks everyone. Take care. Thanks. All right, Chris, I'm handing it over to you. Or actually, we can move right on to Ramses if he is on the line. Hey, yeah, I'm here. Oh, great. Well, then why don't you go ahead, Ramses? Cool. I do need to share my slides. Let's see. Let's see. I think that'll work, right? Okay, share. And slide show. All right, there we go. Do you guys, do you see it in slideshow mode or do you still see it in a regular? It's in slideshow mode now. All right. Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Ramses Madu. I'm the division manager of planning policy and sustainability in the city of San Jose. Um, I had the good fortune of helping lead the team um, that developed um, the city of San Jose's um, response to SB 743. Um, we completed this um, uh, December or De Feb, uh, March um, uh, 2018 now. Um, so we've had quite a bit of time um, to kind of uh, uh, sit on it and learn from this. And so I'm going to go through a little bit of how we got to where we are and then some thoughts on lessons learned um, and, and areas that we all might want to grow in as we go forward. Um, so for us, um, uh, there, there was a lot to this policy and hopefully a lot of what we did along with, with OPR's really great guidance, a lot of the weeds have been cut. Um, we um, saw it in this kind of five part um, uh, uh, perspective here of, of really aligning all of our policies together, facilitating the right things, streamlining our, pro our processes, um, promoting the kinds of mitigations we really want to see and, and, and then gaining on mon monitoring, but that one in particular is, is still quite um, uh, difficult. 
Um, so for the city of San Jose, you know, why did we take this on so early? Um, uh, you know, we're, 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 um, we're a massive city, but, but honestly, we're, we're about 80% single family homes. Um, and uh, you know, we're, sure, we have a few high rises downtown um, and a few urban centers uh, kind of through our 180 square miles. We also have horse ranches um, and, and all that. And so um, you know, certainly we're kind of a little bit of a microcosm of, of the state in that way. Um, but so why would we take on such a big policy change early on? Well, this is a, a, a very simplified graphic of what our, um, our modal goals are in our general plan. Um, in, a, in a sense, cut down in half the use of automobiles for single occupancy uh, trips um, and uh, uh, triple our uh, active and transit use in, uh, in the city. Um, this uh, strategy, of course, aligns with the urbanization goals of the city and, and is, is bolstered um, by our, uh, our environmental planning. Um, we're, we're really, as a city, trying to, to figure out how, how to kind of you know, bend the curve in, in the right direction. Um, you know, the old planning modeling, uh, planning model or paradigm um, has led to this. This is the morning snapshot of a typical day, Wednesday, um, of the, the morning commute. Um, and you can see here, all, all the red on that is, is, the, um, uh, is all the major thoroughfares auto-wise. Our old paradigm is in a sense making it um, so that we are just, um, we're just, we can't grow that much anymore. Um, you know, a lot of people say this is a, a symptom of success. Well, that's true. Um, we can't have, we can't keep having that much more success if this is what this looks like. Um, and so we, we were very happy to kind of try to figure out, all right, um, uh, how do we, how do we uh, bend this curve? How do we, how do we get into a better position and, and start creating um, and, and maturing the, the non-auto portions of the transportation network? Um, and, and another thing that really uh, uh, got us there is this. So the, the, this is a graph of the totality of and then the proportion of um, greenhouse gases uh, associated with the city and our own inventory. Our inventory is, is, is going down. And, and if you see the latest data, I really need to update this slide. Um, the latest data um, uh, shows us again going down. And, and, and again, the transportation sector's portion of the overall has gone up as well as its actual uh, 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 base amount. So the, you know, transportation is the largest group, largest sector of, um, or is the largest piece of our greenhouse emissions pie. Um, and we're, we're really focused on trying to reduce the overall pie, which means transportation is becoming more and more important to doing this. Okay, so those are kind of the big, you know, policy directives that led us to wanting to do this. Um, and, 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 you know, we, we all have to do this anyway. So um, uh, how, do we, how do we do this right? Um, so I, I put this slide in to talk about an important piece. While what we're doing here is replacing a CEQA threshold uh, uh, from LOS to VMT. That is not the totality of what we all do for transportation analysis. And I think cities really thinking through carefully, what do they want out of, um, out of their transportation analysis? What do they want out of their transportation systems? Um, and making sure that, that you really think through how that is related to VMT and, and trying to figure out how to, how to um, uh, hitch that into your thresholds and analysis methodologies in there. But also, look, a lot of how you do transportation analysis is outside of CEQA um, and, and, and really uh, getting um, the, the right methodologies throughout your approach to transportation analysis is important. Um, so for example, you know, we look at a lot of local transportation impacts, our sidewalks proper, our bike lanes whole, is there enough transit capacity? And we still look at some localized LOS analysis way outside of CEQA, right? We still look and make sure that the, the car system isn't uh, getting totally overrun by a particular development. And I think making sure people are kind of understanding the larger scope of what all of this is, is important. Um, so to craft this, this larger perspective and how we, are, how we work to update our overall policy as well as our, 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 our um, CEQA thresholds around transportation, uh, we brought together a very large group. Um, this group, um, uh, we plus public works really led this transportation when I say we, 
Um, but we had an immense amount of other interdepartmental work. Um, the way that, you know, this is really a paradigm shift and LOS has been along around so long that there are so many other things that have ended up find, finding their, uh, finding a little bit of a, a leverage or, or otherwise pinned to LOS. Um, and so trying to find out how to um, unwind things without damaging things was, was probably the most interesting uh, piece of, of work. And, and again, here's a list of all those who, who really spent a lot of time uh, kind of working this through. Um, so, okay, the, the kind of the overall direction, who we worked with. Now, what did we actually do as a city? What actions did we take? Um, for San Jose, uh, we had uh, general plan text amendments. Um, this unwound um, how LOS was, was put in the general plan. Um, and we updated some kind of historical uh, markers that are in the general plan uh, to, to, to uh, memorialize the, the action itself. Of course, we uh, created a new transportation analysis policy. For us, it's called Council Policy 5-1. Um, and this is really the, the, the heart of it, right? This is where the thresholds were adopted. This is where the, um, the primary uh, uh, um, uh, legal action was taken, right? Um, and we also had to, at that point, um, uh, deal with uh, a transition that you guys probably don't have to deal with as much, um, but we had to write uh, some kind of bridge language between the, 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 the at that point, current policy and the new one um, that, we're, that we're all going towards now. Um, so uh, you probably see this at least a little bit as, as kind of acknowledging pipeline projects uh, what stage in the process does the new methodology take over from the, from the old and all that. Um, but again, I think some of the new legal uh, readouts on, on whether we're even allowed to use LOS, even if you're not in a VMT fresh, uh, adopted threshold city, um, are interesting to listen to um, uh, when we're doing that. Another interesting thing we did was adopt infill opportunity zones. Um, this is a, uh, a piece of, of the, the puzzle where we still have an interesting scenario in California where um, uh, uh, congestion management programs are under a certain legal pillar that still requires them um, to use level of service in their metrics for, the, uh, for their areas. Infill opportunity zones allow you to get out of that to some degree. Um, there are certain conditions of areas um, that you can call infill opportunity zones and, and in those areas um, you can uh, remove LOS as a, as, a, as a metric. And we had really great support from our uh, congestion management program, um, our, uh, our agency CMA, uh, the, the, the Valley Transportation Authority, VTA here, um, actually alerted us to this and, and helped us kind of devise that. Um, and we also, uh, as part of our actions with council, asked for further direction as to where we wanna go. And, and, and you know, this, this was one, one step uh, in, in a larger process of realigning how the city sees transportation and deals with it. Um, and, and part of that is, is, is a second phase of work, which we're actually undertaking now, um, which is all is an, an update to the policy um, uh, and, and all that. Um, and then outside of council actions, um, we as staff uh, uh, helped create uh, two other things. So one was a VMT estimation tool, which you can find on our website. Um, this tool has been, uh, an incredible, uh, 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 use, incredibly useful thing. Um, it estimates the VMT per parcel across the city, um, as well as our estimates of the VMT reductions that different mitigations uh, would have. Um, this tool is now being um, uh, broadened and taken up by VTA to be used across the county. Um, and we've talked to, to, to um, uh, uh, CMPs across the state actually about how this might play um, in their own areas. And I believe there's a few other places taking our version of it or, or some similar version of it on. Um, and then of course, the actual transportation analysis guidelines themselves, um, at least in the city of San Jose, um, we don't need to have council kind of say what everything is. We just kind of get the big thresholds from them. And then we have a, an analysis and an implementation guideline written and authorized by um, uh, the Department of Transportation. Um, so those are all the, the kinds of actions we've taken. Um, now, what are some of the things we did that are a little bit different um, than, than the things that uh, Chris uh, and the team have uh, laid out for you uh, in, the, in the webinar so far? So in our screening criteria, 
Um, we put an and between two of the screening criteria that are suggested in, in, the, um, in the guidance. Um, we wanted uh, low VMT areas that are also uh, high quality transit to be screened out. Um, some of our models are a little odd. You end up with places that are ostensibly low VMT, um, but uh, they, that don't really pass the smell test in terms of giving uh, screening criteria. Uh, or giving, get, allowing them to be screened out. So areas that are, are, are quite transit poor um, and the idea that those areas would actually uh, suffice to, to support uh, um, lifestyles that are low VMT um, really just didn't, didn't pass the smell test for us. So we, we put an and between those two things and, and created one of our screening criteria in that way. The other one was locally serving retail. Um, for a place like San Jose, this one really makes sense. Um, and so we actually went a bit further um, than, than um, uh, what's recommended in, in OPR's guidance and, and increased the size of the part of the project all the way to 100,000 square feet based on some, um, some research uh, within the city as to what kinds of retail would fit in that. Basically, we're trying to avoid getting uh, um, uh, regional uh, retail, uh, mostly malls, and, and big box stores out of that um, and, and, and at most get a, a medium uh, sized uh, supermarket with, with some, some add-on um, stores. Um, let's see, so other things we did here were our residential, we chose to be more stringent than what uh, 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 OPR uh, recommends. Um, we found that the Bay Area regional number um, really created such a huge amount of our city that would be um, um, uh, in, effect, in a sense met the threshold that we thought that was kind of silly. Um, it, we just really, you know, we're, we're, we're not trying to get sites out of this analysis. We want them to do it um, if it makes sense. Um, and again, we're trying to drive the environment towards this low VMT kind of thing. So we, we chose a more stringent threshold there, which is for us, the cities. Um, industrial employment areas, um, we chose not to use the 15% below as recommended uh, uh, for other land use types. Um, and, and we actually define this, um, uh, you know, in OPR's guidance, there isn't really a definition for this yet. Um, and we chose this to be at the regional average instead of 15% below um, based on, on, on some basic uh, uh, understandings of in most industrial areas, um, the likelihood of, of the investment that's needed for those uh, are, is, is, isn't really there. And so what I mean by that is we're, un, we're less likely to invest in a lot of transit um, or really get the, the bike facilities up to snuff to get um, uh, the type of change, modal change that we need there to meet the 15% below. So we thought we were putting, in a sense, an albatross around the land use that we all really need. Um, and then transportation projects. Um, we did choose to put ourselves to the 15% below and came up with a methodology um, uh, for um, how, how to analyze transportation projects and hold them to the same criteria. Um, we are working with Caltrans um, and on, the, on, a, on a committee there to kind of help understand how this all plays together. Um, I know some guidance just came out from them. Um, and then our last thing we did is for statements of overriding consideration we did put in the policy that, that we can't just do statements of overriding consideration without, uh, without some type of action. And so we did create kind of a fees program uh, for projects that do go over, um, that they pay a fee in relationship to the amount of VMT that they were unable to, uh, to mitigate. All right, so facilitating this. Um, this is our map of uh, residential VMT um, and how it, um, it plays out across the city. And um, you can really see here, the green is, are the areas that, um, that already meet the threshold. And you can see why uh, I talked about earlier, taking a more stringent approach uh, to this one was important. Uh, the green was even bigger with roughly the size of the green now, plus the yellow, which is just kind of silly. So uh, we, we, we went for a more stringent one. Um, and so this is facilitating the right kinds of development. It's really starting to uh, focus development more in the areas uh, in the green where there is transit, where there is transportation infrastructure. And you can see here in those pink areas, um, it's quite difficult to develop. Um, and, and, and we like that for now. Um, this is our employment areas. 
Um, you can again see here our, our threshold areas are roughly our, our core downtown area, um, which is the kind of uh, ovoid blob in the middle right above the 87 sign and then to the south of there. Um, yeah. So streamlining. Um, streamlining has been really important. Um, we were able to uh, get, doing our analysis, this is what we ended up with is full streamlining. These are the areas where if a project meets the uh, project criteria and, uh, uh, um, yeah, and, and fits into one of these turquoise areas, if you're in the market rate housing one, that's uh, where, where they would pass um, and get a, get a um, meets the threshold or is better than the threshold meeting. Um, and for affordable, we did loosen up some of the rules there um, so that uh, it would gain a lot more area in the city to, to, to be uh, to grow there. Um, this here is another element of our streamlining. Um, this is our VMT calculator I was speaking about before. Um, a project puts in their parcel number here up on the left, um, and we actually have a per parcel uh, uh, estimation of VMT. Um, we, we assume that to be the, the, uh, the VMT for the site. Um, and then a project can go through and define its characteristics here on the left, uh, you know, single family dwelling units, uh, the kind of different elements of the project. Um, and then here in the middle, um, in the light blue area, you have different tiers. Tier one is open, you see tier two, three, and four here. These are the mitigations um, that we as a city recognize offhand as, as potentially reducing VMT. Um, and what's been incredibly useful for this uh, about this tool is that one, uh, developers and consultants can just look at this and develop their project um, without having to have us go back and forth um, for significant amounts of time um, to, uh, to kind of play out their ideas and they can come to us with an already baked um, uh, proposal uh, in a way that was, was hard before. Um, it's also helping us as staff um, process things quite a bit faster um, and give us a sense for um, um, which, which, which direction we'd want to take. Um, importantly, every, all the math behind this is based on really deep um, uh, research. Every single mitigation um, is, is backed up by the best research we, get, we could have. Um, we didn't allow a lot of uh, what we would normally consider mitigations in here um, because we couldn't find good enough uh, research to support that. And I'll talk a little bit about that in, in kind of next steps because that's actually an issue for all of us. Um, all right, so promote. So this, this is a little bit like Chris's graph earlier kind of shows, all right, business as usual is, is our dark gray line. Um, and, and we really need to be pushing the curve down towards these, uh, these other things. And these different blobs represent what different, um, what different uh, uh, mitigation uh, or, or actions could do to reduce our, um, uh, our overall greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and what I think is really important for, for transportation planners like myself uh, to really realize through this is that a lot of what we want actually is getting the land uses in the right place. Um, so getting more people next to transit, getting more people in already low VMT areas is actually one of the most uh, efficient um, and, and best uh, uh, mitigations we can get. And so we've, we've had to give up a little bit of our leverage in terms of getting uh, dollar values and transportation improvements. Um, and, and instead getting these land use changes um, that, that are so important. Um, and we kind of already looked through those different tiers in our, in our calculator, but here are the different types of mitigations that we've been really focusing on. Again, project, um, which aligns with, with this, um, this notion of, of uh, the location, plus actual uh, you know, characteristics of the project. Is it walkable? Is it making sure it finds good links into the bike and, and, and pedestrian network? Secondly, we, we really look at mobility. And what we mean by this is the ch actual changes to the transportation network. Um, we, we really value these the most um, outside of the project definition itself. Then after that, we have parking and TDM. You know, this is things like unbundling parking, reducing parking amounts, um, and then our, our kind of host of TDM programs, whether they be shuttles or, or transit passes and all that. Um, for us, it's been really important to, um, to not focus on um, TDM as much right away. Um, at least in a city like San Jose, we have a lot of, of you know, ground 
changes we need to do before we start uh, uh, getting into TDM. Meaning we, we really want to focus the value we get out of development on actually building things that will create the multimodal environment we all need to, to be able to get this um, uh, to get this big paradigm shift in place. All right, let's do another. There we go. Um, and then monitoring, I'll just talk really quickly about this. You know, monitoring is actually really hard. Um, we are we're working through how to do post project analysis. Um, we, we've uh, created relationships with, with groups like Streetlight, which is a big data source, um, to kind of figure out. All right, how do we how do we really figure out? All right, is this stuff working? Um, and how do we re reset our baseline in a, in some kind of regularized clip? Um, and this, these are problems we we still need to work through, um, though um, we're. Where we'll be having proposals soon. All right, so I will kind of walk through phase one here, um, setting our, our thresholds and, and kind of really setting up the, the basic legal framework for having this. Um, we're in phase two already, um, and this is uh, uh, helping uh, VTA set up the, the countywide tool um, for, for use. We've been putting a lot of effort into, into helping that happen. Um, trying to develop more local data, right? Really trying to get more site-specific, uh, localized information on, on how this all works. Um, and um, we're building out a TDM and parking ordinance that kind of follows on this. Um, and then two other things that are very interesting. One, um, we're, we've been working with Caltrans and, and some other cities like LA um, on uh, in San Francisco on uh, developing research need statements and we've already got a couple funded um, that look at uh, what types of mitigations don't yet have the, the research behind them to, to give us legal nexus. Um, and we're looking at this interesting idea of VMT banks and exchanges, which you'll hear more about um, from our next presenters um, and kind of figuring out how we can as a region approach um, not only the analysis through this countywide VMT tool, but also the mitigation. Um, so um, some of the big questions that uh, still kind of bother us or plague us as we're, we're trying to kind of work through after a year of this is, is how can we be consistent, how do we consistently implement across jurisdictions, um, right? I think this question came up earlier in, in one, of the, one of the question uh, periods. Um, it is hard um, and, we, and we do need to make sure um, that we're doing this. Um, and, you know, in some regions, it may be a little easier um, because most jurisdictions might rely on the say the same model from from a, a from their MPO or their CMA, um, and if that's the case, that's really good. Um, but making sure that all the cities kind of recognize that the model outputs and, and analyze them in similar ways is going to be really important because these are going to end up being really sticky, silly legal battles because we're we're looking at how VMT is is you know the baseline and the and the basic analysis of what's out there can be different and that, that can really become a problem. And we're very lucky here in, in, in Santa Clara County um, that we have a, a, a CMA taking leadership to try to create um, a kind of shared ground truth. The next thing is, is how do we get effective uh, regional mitigation? And also how do we recognize mitigations as effective? Um, the, the second question really gets answered by, by hopefully the same thing as above where you have a, a CMA really setting up the ground truth for what analysis looks like and then um, hopefully what mitigations look like too. Um, but then there's this interesting idea of mitigation banks, um, which is in a sense a pool of, of projects that, that have VMT reduction uh, capabilities or, or, or uh, aspects um, that need funding um, and, and getting projects and particular projects that can't reduce VMT to meet thresholds to pay into that bank um, could really be a great way to get some bigger projects that help us all um, get built. Um, we've also struggled a little bit with, with, you know, we're getting the land use focus that we've been wanting, um, but now how do we get, um, uh, how do we make sure those, those sites in the low MV, VMT areas are still contributing to a better transportation system on the ground? Um, in San Jose, again, we, we, we don't yet have a fully multimodal network. We, we have kind of uh, portions of it that are quite good. Um, but they're but they're very small portions, and so we still need to make sure that we're getting investment in the transportation system, um, and we are finding ways to do that through through um, starting to in, in, insert multimodal analysis into our local transportation analysis, as I was talking about outside the CEQA um, uh, context. Um, we still need to improve VMT data collection evaluation methodologies. 
um, the, the ground truth information um, a lot of times is based on census data between county or travel between counties and that is not good enough yet. Um, and then there's this question of, of VMT for other land uses that I'm sure has already come up. Um, how do you deal with industrial sites? We did define that, but is that standardized? How do you deal with it for a church? How do you deal with it for a park? Um, you know, we're, we're constantly finding creative and interesting ways to, to kind of do that. All right, um, that's my presentation, sorry. And then here at the end, um, if you wanna look up our resources, our calculator, our guidelines, our actual policy language, there's another presentation we did on there. Um, you can check out here, um, uh, 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 this website uh, on the bottom and it's all there. All right, thank you and I'll take questions. Great, thanks so much, Ramsey. So um, one question we have for you is, uh, what evidence did you use to support um, the determination that um, 100,000 square feet retail uh, was local serving? Yeah, so we looked at, uh, you know, we kind of defined what do we think local serving retail is? Um, and we said, well, supermarkets are kind of the biggest thing that we believe it, it is a, lo a local serving. Um, and, um, and, and kind of had a whole list of those things. Um, and then we said, what, what, do we, what do we believe are not locally serving? And looked at the examples in our, in our city. So shopping malls, really big, bo um, you know, uh, big box stores or, or very specialized stores. And we, we found that this 100,000 uh, square foot limit kind of cut those, those well enough into two different segments, right? So, uh, you know, roughly 90% of what we consider to be locally serving fell within this 100,000. Um, and, and, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's something like 85, 90% of what we consider to be above, uh, not uh, locally serving retail went above the line. Um, and so we, we found a whole number that kind of worked right there. Um, so it really was based on, on, on looking at what retail is in the city um, and, um, and, 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 and making a judgment call around what we think is and isn't locally serving and, and finding a, a, a whole around number that, that found that line best. Great, thanks. Um, can you give the website address again? Um, some folks are asking for it. They couldn't see it on your slide. Yeah, so if you just type in um, um, San Jose VMT, um, it'll, it'll come up in, in Google. Um, it is uh, San Jose ca.gov uh, backslash vmt. Perfect, thanks so much. Um, another question we have is, uh, does San Jose have a definition of locally serving hotels? Um, and if so, what is the basis for that definition? Um, um, I haven't been close enough to the latest way we've dealt with hotels. Um, we have generally said that hotels are like retail in that you build a hotel, as long as it's not a resort or a, and, and this is the question I think you're asking, um, as long as it's not a resort or a, a kind of, you know, specialized tourist attraction in itself, we've said most hotels should be treated as locally serving. Um, though I think some nuance has been added to, to, to the discussion since I last really got into the weeds on this. Um, but, you know, th there's a, a, a bit of a judgment call there around when something becomes an attraction in itself, or is it just you know, serving the function of, of, of providing lodging for travelers. Um, and I think, you know, there's a bit of a judgment call between those two things. And, and that's all I can really say on that right now. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, the issue of hotels has come up quite a bit today. And if you have a hotel or an event center that is an attraction and is pulling people from out of the San Jose area, how do you do that analysis? Yeah, we would, we would you know, a hotel is most like retail. And so we would say, okay, um, does this, is this in a sense a regional draw? You know, you say a convention center or something like that, a convention center hotel. Um, we would then move to what we would do for regional retail, which is a, 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 a VMT analysis of a, a net uh, VMT analysis and really try to figure out, all right, um, you know, it is possible that regional retail, additional regional retail actually reduces VMT um, in the same way that local retail does, but you have to kind of do the analysis to figure that out. Um, and so we would, we would approach it in the same way. What, you know, in a sense, do a gravity model of all the similar types of, of, um, uh, uh, of land uses and figure out if, if there's a uh, reduction in, in, in trips or trip lengths because of an addition or not. Great. Um, additionally, at some point you talked about accessible jobs. 
Um, and someone was wondering if you could provide specific examples within San Jose of accessible jobs. Hmm, I wonder what I was saying. Um, I mean, accessible jobs are jobs that that are are don't require long distances for people to travel. Um, and so in the San Jose context, it's very specific. We, we have a very um, odd relationship to the rest of the Bay Area, particularly Silicon Valley. Um, we, we've historically been a, a bedroom community. Um, you know, we're, 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 a, uh, uh, we're the only big city in America that has a lower population in the daytime than at night. Um, and so this basic idea of getting jobs closer to where people live is, is the basic idea of accessible jobs. Does that meet the question or is there a further accessible can mean so many things? I think that that answers the question. Um, one final question, since you mentioned uh, religious facilities and parks, that's also come up um, within our Q&A. So how did San Jose handle re religious facilities and parks? Um, again, I think they're, they're most like retail um, until you get to kind of like a mega church thing, but, but I haven't seen any projects come in at that size. Um, both are very similar to retail um, and, and you know, um, a denomination um, that has another branch um, may um, reduce travel to the other, other church though. Um, that gets, uh, it can get a little sticky politically between churches, so I won't go too far into that. Um, but yeah, so we, we, we would approach them that way. Um, though again, particularly churches can be a real draw. And so we, we'd have to make a judgment call as to the level of draw we, we might expect from them. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, that brings us to 425. So we're going to move on to our next presentation um, by Ethan Elkine uh, and Ted Lamb from Berkeley's CLEA uh, Center. And thank you so much, Ramses, for your presentation. That was fantastic. All right, Ethan and Ted. All right, thanks so much. So my name is Ethan Elkind. I direct the climate program at UC Berkeley Law's uh, Center for Law, Energy and the Environment, or CLEA. Uh, and thanks to everyone at OPR for uh, allowing me and uh, my colleague, Ted Lamb, who you'll hear from in a minute for uh, providing some remarks. I'm gonna focus on, like both of us are gonna focus on the mitigation piece of SB 743. So a bit of the sort of the legal background around when mitigation is, is triggered and how that mitigation may take shape. And then Ted will talk more specifically about VMT mitigation banks or exchanges, uh, which is a subject that we covered at CLE in a report that you can download. I'll give you a preview now. Hopefully you can see it through my fake background here. Uh, I should, of course, you know it's fake because it's a high-speed rail station and those haven't been built, so I didn't have to say it was fake. But anyways, this is the report. It's called Implementing SB 743, an analysis of vehicle miles traveled banking and exchange framework. So more of our uh, more information on our remarks will be found in, in that document if you want to look at it. Uh, but mitigation in general is really where the rubber meets the road in SB 743. And what happens when you have a project any type of project, as you've been discussing uh, on the webinar, we just heard from, from Ramses as well, and it has significant impacts, they have to be mitigated where feasible uh, under the California Environmental Quality Act. And so there's a, a specific standard for what defines feasibility in this case. So if you look at the guidelines section 15364, it means a, a measure that's capable of being accomplished in a successful manner within a reasonable period of time, taking into account economic, environmental, legal, social, and technological factors. So those are the kinds of mitigation measures, broadly speaking, from that legal standard uh, that that the lead agency would have to require that the project uh, develop or put in place. So what are we talking about when we're talking about VMT mitigation measures? Well, I know you've heard uh, uh, some of them uh, already, but the, the basic category would be anything that can reduce vehicle miles traveled. And so one sort of starting category under that framework would be uh, pricing mechanisms. Uh, or financial mechanisms of some sort. So that could mean that uh, transit passes, for example, could be issued uh, by the project developer or transit subsidies, um, those types of pricing mechanisms. Uh, and, and secondly, it could involve a change in the use uh, uses in the project itself. So for example, if you had, let's say a sp sprawling auto-oriented 
uh, residential only subdivision uh, that was being proposed, you know, one way to mitigate those vehicle miles travel that would otherwise be essentially imposed upon the rest of the region from people commuting long distances would be to change the design of the project. So maybe you would locate then uh, office next to the housing so that presumably people could just maybe walk across the street to get to work instead of having to drive 25 miles uh, you know, each way. Or you could put some important uh, retail or other types of services located right within the project. So a grocery store, which is a major generator of vehicle miles traveled, uh, as many of us are, are realizing, especially these days with the uh, sheltering in place. So even locating something as simple as a grocery store within the residential subdivision could greatly reduce VMT. So that's, that's another option. Uh, so we have the sort of the pricing and the financial piece of it, uh, incentives with the project design itself. And then the third would be uh, actual investments in infrastructure that could reduce vehicle miles traveled. Um, and those investments could be either on site or off site. And the offsite piece is what Ted will talk about with these VMT banks or exchanges where a developer could, could pay into or purchase uh, essentially invest in an offsite uh, reduction measure of VMT. But the kinds of infrastructure that we're talking about, just as a sort of general matter, it could be something as basic as a new bus stop, a new shuttle drop off point, uh, to something like new pedestrian infrastructure or new bike lanes, or something like bus only lanes or a bus rapid transit line that could connect from a project to uh, other destinations that would help reduce the uh, single passenger uh, vehicle travel that would otherwise take place. Uh, even up to something as big as a, a, a rail transit line, uh, or even what you see behind me here, maybe one day, the, a high-speed rail line. Although, uh, I mean, take everything aside about high-speed rails viability, I think even a rail transit investment is very unlikely because these are such expensive uh, systems to build and your VMT benefit, I think, is probably going to be pretty attenuated given all the different funding sources that would have to go in. So I think mainly what we're talking about would be sort of smaller scale infrastructure that has some proven VMT uh, reduction benefits, uh, like, a, again, a, a bike lane or, a, or maybe a bus only lane, but certainly pedestrian infrastructure would be part of that as well. Uh, so those are, are the types of mitigation uh, and at least on site. And there's a debate about you know, how much we really want to encourage this mitigation to take place on site versus off site. Uh, I think there are pros and cons to both. I mean, certainly if you're a neighbor of the project, uh, you would like to see as much done on site as possible. Uh, if you're concerned about equity, sort of geographic equity, you may not want to see a lot of uh, the impacts happen in one area with a project, but then the um, mitigation measures, presumably those benefits happening elsewhere. Um, so all those considerations have to be taken into account. Uh, but as you just heard from Ramses that, you know, you don't really want to see a statements of overriding consideration being issued uh, where the lead agency would basically say, yes, we recognize there are unavoidable significant impacts. There's not much that can be done feasibly about it. So we're just going to go ahead and uh, certify this environmental review document, issue a statement of overriding considerations. You heard from Ramses that in San Jose, they have some conditions associated with that. But we think that an offsite mitigation uh, available option like a bank or exchange can reduce the uh, likelihood that statements of overriding consideration would have to be issued, that there's, there'd be a, a pretty good sort of uh, safety net uh, in a way uh, for mitigation measures. So with that, let me pass it over to Ted who can talk more about VMT mitigation banks or exchanges. Great, thank you, Ethan. Um, so as Ethan mentioned, in the context of VMT mitigation, the uh, need for uh, potential offsite mitigation options is particularly uh, significant. And this is just the nature of VMT uh, uh, versus the prior LOS system. Many of the um, uh, development locations may not be able to mitigate their VMT on site in a significant way. And the creation of a mitigation bank or exchange is a uh, method to put some structure around that offsite mitigation if it is done in a uh, significant way, and if there's a lot of it in a particular city or a region, then creating a banker exchange will allow that um, local government to do this in a structured way and in an organized way to make sure that um, funds flow toward the most uh, pressing projects. So I'm just going to present some sort of threshold con design considerations for these banks and exchanges, and they, they fall in four categories, the size or scope of the exchange, the project selection process, the concept of verification and additionality, and the uh, equity considerations that go along with these. 
Um, so as a preliminary step, there's the question of a bank versus an exchange, uh, ultimately reaching the same goal, but slightly different structure. Uh, a bank is a system where developers uh, would commit funds to a general pot for use on mitigation projects that the local government entity in charge of the bank selects itself. Whereas an exchange, um, that government body would uh, perhaps create a list of eligible mitigation projects, but developers would be allowed to select the mitigation project or projects that they would like to uh, fund, essentially. And so the there's the design difference there. There's no, I think, legal distinction between the two that for any essential purposes other than what the local government uh, feels is, is the best fit for the its, its jurisdiction and for its public to have uh, transparency and involvement in the process. Um, so the first consideration in designing a bank or exchange is the uh, size or scope, the, the, the catchment area for the, the bank that uh, will determine where a developer uh, can send a mitigation project that is off site. Um, again, there's no real, I think, legal uh, definition on what this needs to be here, but the region or the, the scope of the bank or exchange needs to be small enough so that it's cohesive and governable, but large enough that there's a diverse uh, and useful set of off site mitigation projects that developers can look to. And again, the issue here is really about. Uh, what a local government and its local population feel is the right balance and uh, how big of a region um, a local government uh, building this type of entity could look to, to to bring a lot of diverse projects in and aggregate a lot of funds together. Um, but that's really a political or a policy question up for the local government to decide. The second consideration that we've identified is the development of a project selection process or a set of standards for project selection. And this is specifically for the mitigation projects themselves, whether it's a local government choosing the projects in a bank or a local government uh, listing and ranking projects uh, in an exchange setup. And this is a really essential aspect that any government creating this sort of bank or exchange really must do a rigorous and, and thoughtful analysis of what factors will uh, give projects more or less weight in the uh, selection process when time comes for a developer to um, pick a mitigation project. So some of these factors might be the cost of the project, um, and that's just you know, the dollars to VMT uh, ratio, dollars to VMT reduction ratio, the time to completion of the project, how quickly the VMT reductions can, be, uh, can start flowing. Uh, an example might be a transit subsidy, a transit pass subsidy where the, uh, it can be funded immediately and start providing VMT benefits immediately, as opposed to a construction project that may take uh, a year or more to uh, be permitted and built. So the VMT benefits are obviously delayed. Um, the extent to which the project gives a direct benefit to the, the public. Again, transit passes will uh, immediately end up in people's pockets, whereas a long-term construction project may not. Um, that's a sort of a political question, but I think one that the uh, governing entity will need to determine how much weight they want to give that factor. And finally, the duration of the VMT benefit itself. If pass, transit pass subsidies are given, how long uh, would they be given for versus a transit station new construction that might have a 50 plus year uh, or longer timeline of VMT benefit. So again, there's no answer to how these factors need to be weighted, but any jurisdiction that's doing this needs to implement a, a rigorous and standardized system for weighting these factors so that the local government or the developers that are choosing projects can um, look at these standards and know that they're choosing the uh, best fit project under the given rules of, the, of the, the city or of the region. The third uh, of the four factors that we want to discuss briefly is the idea of additionality. And this is the concept that any VMT reductions achieved in a bank or exchange must be additional to reductions that otherwise would have been achieved under uh, other laws or under prior existing plans or funding allocations. And the concept here is that the local government and the lead agency cannot give, essentially give mitigation credit for mitigation projects that otherwise would have happened if they were already budgeted by the government or if the developer already had plans for those, then um, they cannot claim credit for it and they must be additional. And this is a relatively straightforward concept, but the uh, accounting for this additionality and verifying it is really essential. The um, components of an, uh, an accounting framework would usually include something like an affirmative statement of additionality from the developer, something like maybe a legal affidavit or um, a memorandum that details uh, the fact that there are no existing funding streams or other legal requirements that would compel this mitigation project. And a verifying entity, a third party that can apply standards of additionality and review those statements to confirm that uh, the project would not otherwise have occurred. 
that ideally would be a state, uh, a state certified body, or at least a regionally certified body, so that there's some level of certainty that the uh, that the verification process is secure. And the the state's cap and trade program for greenhouse gas emissions is a pretty good example. The offset protocol in that system is a pretty good example of how additionality can be uh, tracked and measured and confirmed and then verified over time. So that's one example of a, a state level initiative, but uh, an example that might be a benefit to local governments that are looking to uh, to implement a system like this. And the final consideration that we that we raise as a sort of a program design consideration is, is perhaps the most important one, which is the uh, concept of geographical equity. And um, one of the benefits of an exchange or mitigation framework is that the, uh, the, the government that is implementing it can distribute mitigation projects geographically. And that's fantastic because it reduces the likelihood that there is uh, infeasible mitigation and increases the likelihood that the government will uh, be able to, to get developers to build these beneficial projects and, and reduce VMT. It does create the risk though that beneficial VMT mitigation projects could be concentrated in certain areas and potentially could lead to um, uh, drawing those projects out of disadvantaged communities. And obviously that's an outcome that any government's going to want to avoid. So there are a couple of ways to ensure this doesn't happen, or at least to mitigate the, uh, the risk of this happening. And they might be in the form of a, uh, a mitigation discount or matching dollars from the local government for a developer that chooses to place a mitigation project in a disadvantaged community, um, or a minimum percentage requirement that in the bank or in the exchange framework that dictates that a, 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 a certain subset of projects, 25% as an example, must be located in those areas. And those are areas that are um, disadvantaged communities that can be uh, pulled from the, the state Cal and Virus Green Mapping Tool or others to identify what are qualifying uh, low income or disadvantaged districts. And the, the SB 535 and AB 1550 program, um, which, which works with the Cal and Virus Green program, is a good model for this, which essentially um, the, the, the programs dictate that a, a certain min minimum percentage of greenhouse gas funds must go to those areas on an annual basis. And I, I think it's 30% right now. And it's a, it's a really clear and clean way to uh, ensure that, that uh, disadvantaged communities see benefit from these mitigation programs. And it's one that I think the state is, uh, is, has been working on for a long time and is pretty uh, uh, proud of as, as an equity lens on a, on a statewide program. So that type of uh, lens or, or minimum percentage is something that uh, is not required under SB 743, but it's something that any um, local government that's putting together a bank or exchange would want to consider implementing or looking at the um, at the state uh, greenhouse gas reduction fund model uh, as they set this up to ensure that mitigation projects don't go into certain areas and development projects don't go into other areas leading to uh, disproportionate VMT impacts across a region. Um, so those are the, the four key considerations that we wanted to raise. There are others that are detailed in our report. And uh, again, you know, these are these are really program design considerations. The, the the most essential thing from a legal perspective for any jurisdiction designing one of these frameworks is, uh, you know, a really clear and rigorous set of, of standards for each of these questions. So that uh, when a developer is working with the program or if a local community is is questioning a decision, there's a very clear framework that's been instituted and then applied um, and documented clearly for for those those bodies to follow. Um, so with that, I think we can turn it over to questions, unless Ethan, you wanted to add any color on one or more of those points. Uh, no, I think we can uh, go to questions. Okay. Great. Um, we do have a question. So the question is, does uh, a VMT exchange have to meet all of the Mitigation Fee Act requirements? Um, it seems like the Mitigation Fee Act only allows cities to fund infrastructure, and we are interested in supporting regional TDM programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can, uh, Ted can offer more detail on this, uh, but yeah, they have to meet the the VMT exchange or bank would have to meet the mitigation fee act requirements, which um, at least in our research, we didn't find that it was only limited to infrastructure and Ted, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, you know, in terms of identifying the purpose of the fee or, you know, in this case, the exchange, um, or you know, making sure that you've documented there's a nexus and the fee is sort of reasonably targeted to, to the you know the level of benefit, et cetera. All that would have would have to be incorporated, and I think it should be pretty straightforward to uh, to incorporate and, and make sure we're following the mitigation fee act. But uh, but Ted, feel free to jump in if I'm missing detail, particularly on this infrastructure versus uh, you know uh, like a fair a fair program, for example. 
Yeah, so it, mitigation fee act absolutely applies, and we did a bit of research into this. It's not the focus of our of our report, but uh, we found that under the the act and under some uh, I think pretty re recent case law, the public facility requirement can be uh, either is in the statute itself or can be read to include not just uh, physical improvements but also services and community amenities. And so I think it's pretty clear that as long as the uh, the the service is is directly related to transit or a VMT uh, reduction, you know, known VMT reduction method, it would not be limited to, you know, hard construction in the ground. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, that is the only question we have about the mitigation piece. Um, so thank you again, guys, for coming out for the third time for our webinars. We really appreciate it. Um, and you always do such a great job. So thanks, Ted and thank Ethan. You. Thank you, Natalie, and to Chris and Jeannie and everyone else. Thank you. All right, and then I believe Chris is up to talk about transportation projects. Thank, thank you, thank all of our guest speakers. Really appreciate you guys taking this time uh, three times. Um, and thanks to those of you who are sticking with us um, in the webinar audience. I'm going to do a quick section on transportation projects and then we'll close. Um, so, talked earlier about um, studying projects in a trip based fashion or in a net VMT total VMT so the same thing um, fashion and transportation projects are studied in a, a net VMT or total VMT approach there's no um, if you were to try and look at them per capita or per employer per something it's very difficult to figure out what that denominator um, is it really makes sense only to study them through um, the, the uh, total or net VMT approach. So uh, using that approach, transit projects tend to reduce the overall amount of VMT. Uh, same with active transportation projects. And then there's a whole set of roadway projects. So quite a long list you'll find on page 22 and 23 of the technical advisory um, that uh, either won't increase any VMT or in increase it so marginally it's very difficult to measure. We recommend presuming those sorts of projects less than significant. Um, meanwhile, adding roadway capacity um, does add VMT, generally speaking, uh, and it does it in these ways. First, you add a um, lane, for example, to a highway, some lane miles, and um, make it easier for the time being to commute by car, and that has uh, these effects. One, uh, longer trips. People go across town to do their shopping rather than at their local store um, using that new faster facility, um, at least faster for the time being until too many people do that. Um, uh, mode shift towards the automobile, you may have been commuting by light rail, um, shifting to your car to use that new um, temporarily open freeway lane, uh, newly generated trips. So you um, stayed home before um, uh, and now you um, uh, use that capacity to uh, take a trip that you didn't before. Um, route changes. Um, so you may have gone out of your way to get to that new free, fro free, free flow lane. Um, and if you did, you probably increased your VMT, but you may have been avoiding that facility before and taking a long way, in which case, in case the, um, the, um, the change will actually could, this, this effect could actually act to reduce VMT. Um, and then uh, more just you, you generally get more dispersed uh, land use development um, when you add roadway capacity and that increases VMT. The net um, aggregate effect is generally to um, substantially increase vehicle travel. In fact, the research finds, uh, and there's a pretty substantial body of research on this, around 20 papers um, assessing and actually quantifying the amount of induced travel. And they find that when you add 1% uh, to the amount of lane miles in your area, you grow VMT by uh, 0.6 to 1%. So, um, and, and the most recent research is, um, is landing on 1% for 1%, increase lane miles by 1%, uh, increase um, the amount of vehicle travel by 1%, and that's leading some of those studies uh, to claim that there is not a um, congestion benefit to adding roadway capacity. Um, those studies, by the way, are controlled for population, economic growth, et cetera. The, that increase in vehicle travel is just uh, resulting from that, that which results from the capacity increase itself. 
So the studies um, uh, come to, the, the, the product of those studies is the, the magnitude of the induced trouble effect, which they characterize as an elasticity. Elasticity is just something from economics. Um, it's simply the percent change, in, in this case, percent change in VMT by the percent change in lane miles. So if you wanted to use this to as a predictor, um, uh, just do a little flipping around algebraically and you come to percent change in lane miles times the existing VMT times the elasticity, those three terms, you multiply them together and get your project VMT. And um, that has been for some time our recommendation on how to assess project VMT. It's very quick and easy once you have the data in hand. And there's a tool from the National Center for Sustainable Transportation that actually does the math for you. All you do is uh, select the facility type, whether interstate or class two or three facility, select your location, um, either metropolitan area or county, um, and select the number of lane miles you're adding. And um, it pivots from the elasticities uh, in the academic literature to assess the amount of induced travel you can expect to see. Uh, of course, this is a general and average figure. It'll be applicable uh, and, and reasonable for most projects, we think. Um, but uh, there will be some sorts of projects like uh, a, a roadway capacity in the form of a bridge between two cities uh, where people had to commute downstream five miles before and cross a bridge there and back up again. Uh, and, and this bridge is allowing them to shorten their travel. So those, those five factors still apply of the, 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 at the um, components of the induced travel phenomenon, but the rerouting one in that case uh, could um, outweigh all of them. Um, so if there's that kind of situation, that isn't a good one for use of this tool, but your um, average uh, roadway capacity project, our current guidance recommends using uh, this tool. Um, uh, people have traditionally used travel demand models and there are um, benefits to those as well. They um, uh, have model the area explicitly, so um, they're not just necessarily averages, um, but there are also some concerns with using travel demand models, uh, and some of them are pretty significant. One is that they, those models don't include land use changes. Uh, you have to do that uh, calculation outside of the model. Um, they sometimes omit the trip generation changes, and statistical noise, I don't mean acoustic noise, but statistical noise can be a real issue. The, the effect of the project um, can get lost in just the background um, uh, um, uh, variation in, in the model, the kind of white noise. Um, there is some evidence out there, and this is something we're looking into in more detail, that, that the travel demand model's response to congested conditions, the, the, the models we have today, uh, their the response to congested conditions um, may be an issue. They, they may um, be problematic, and so we need to see how, what that effect what effect that has on induced travel. And of course, travel demand models are very um, complex tools with a lot of inputs. So transparency can also be an issue. Um, we're in the process of working with Caltrans to convene a group of ex experts to think through um, what the most accurate approaches are um, using uh, one or, or the other, or both, perhaps both of these tools, travel demand models and the elasticity approach. Um, our current recommendations in the technical advisory, and again, um, keep your eye out for updates on this as, as we um, uh, do work on this with Caltrans, um, but the recommendations are first use the elasticities wherever possible. Um, for example, the NCST tool that I showed you a moment ago. Um, uh, if you're using a travel demand model, adjust those results um, so that they're in line with the empirical research um, or employ an expert panel or a land use model, uh, which you can iterate with the travel demand model and then uh, check those with the empirical approach. Again, a third time, I just wanna emphasize that we are reviewing this. So keep your eyes on this space. Um, there may be more uh, nuanced uh, um, and additional guidance um, coming out soon. Okay, I'll stop there for a few minutes of questions before we wrap up. Okay, great. Um, so we have two questions on transportation projects. Um, so if it can be shown that a city's general plan circulation and land use elements result in residential and employee VMT efficiencies that are 15% below regional averages, is it reasonable to assume that no additional VMT analysis is needed at the project level for the circulation element roadways um, needed to support the planned growth in the general plan? So first, thanks Natalie. First, this is, um, 
this is guidance contained in our technical advisor that I didn't mention, but you're, you're looking for it with BMT effects, um, not at local streets and collectors, but at, for highways and, um, and uh, in many cases, arterials, large arterials, um, where, uh, the con where congestion on those roads um, um, that is relieved by extra additional capacity um, will lead to this additional travel. So that, that again, isn't going to be the case for, um, in generally speaking, for a collector or um, local road. Um, that said, um, we recognize that uh, land use, yet land uses like office and um, residential will generate vehicle travel. Um, but it's also true and, and uh, clear from the research that roadway capacity will often and generally induce vehicle travel. So um, dealing with the land use side doesn't address the effect of the roadway project. You do need to look at the roadway project, uh, roadway capacity project, um, independently of land use um, effects or land use plans. Now, uh, we talked a little bit about transportation plans earlier and transportation plans, um, Jeannie, uh, pointed out in, uh, in, from a, a legal and um, CEQA guidelines perspective that those may be streamlined if, um, uh, but um, they would need to themselves um, achieve uh, environmental goals of, of uh, hitting our greenhouse gas emissions reduction requirements. Um, uh, so we're looking forward to getting to the, to the point where we can um, do tiering um, uh, in that way. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, the other question is, have any studies been done yet that look at the relationship between airport improvements and VMT? It's interesting. Um, I am not familiar with any, but I would be surprised if there haven't been as, um, as, as uh, airport improvements, whether or not they've been done in a city that has shifted its metric to VMT. Um, they've certainly been done in the past uh, decade and some where we've been doing uh, GHG analyses. And if you're doing a GHG analysis, you're looking at the change in vehicle travel patterns. And then even LOS analyses um, generally kind of have a, a VMT analysis embedded in them and then have to do some extra steps beyond that, um, all the, the routing and, and micro simulation. Um, so so I, I have no doubt that has been studied. I'm not myself familiar with um, with that, but essentially, you're if you're adding to an airport's capacity, you're going to be adding to the number of uh, if, assuming the capacity actually draws um, more people uh, to the airport, then you're going to be adding to the amount of vehicle travel going to the airport. Great. Um, so that's it for transportation questions. Um, since we have a couple more minutes, um, we can answer. Uh, our top question here as well, which is, uh, would consistency with the MPO's RTP SCS be an appropriate threshold for VMT since the RTP SCS must be consistent with CARB scoping plan? Um, so thanks for that question. That's, a, that's an important one and a good one. Um, if the RTP SCS were uh, consistent with the scoping plan, um, then yes, it would be. That would be a significant. That would be a, a sufficient. Um, uh, that would be a sufficient for for tiering from for a transportation project. Unfortunately, there is consistency. I, I pointed this out on a, a slide early on. There is consistency in most places um, with SB three seventy five targets, but those targets themselves have been set through a process that is in part political and not entirely technical. And um, does not did not those targets did not achieve sufficient depth of VMT um, reduction or containment in order to reach the um, our climate goals and and that is spelled out um, explicitly in CARB's uh, materials. So um, we look forward to uh, getting those plans um, in in line with climate goals and and being able to doing that being able to do that that streamlining and tiering. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, I think that answers all the questions except maybe one about um, the New Hall Ranch decision, um, which talked about using statewide thresholds for individual local projects um, and how right. our situation here is different since we're recommending basing your VMT thresholds on statewide climate targets. 
Right. So the the um, what New Hall Ranch, and I'm not I'm not a um, a legal expert or a lawyer. So so there's that grain of salt, and we don't provide legal advice. But um, my understanding is that the New Hall Ranch case expressed concerns about the method of crosswalking state greenhouse gas goals and targets to the project level. And, and I think I think uh, you know, as a technical person, look at that. Looking at that, I think that was a uh, a, it makes sense that there were concerns raised and, and, um, and um, we have gone back and created what we think is a very strong defensible and backed by significant, um, by, by uh, substantial evidence uh, crosswalk. Um, we've worked with the California Resources Board to do so and you can see the uh, work documented in a, um, a document that's both on our website and on theirs. Um, uh, when I actually, I will go ahead and flip because you all have the questions information to the last slide a little bit prematurely because it has the um, the resources web page. Um, so this will get you to our SB seven forty three web page, and one of the documents prominent on there in the first screen or so is this document from CARB um, documenting that crosswalking process. Okay, great. Um, well, now it is 4.58. Uh, so we'll go ahead and wrap up and conclude our webinar. Uh, we hope that you found this information helpful. A recording of this webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel and will be linked to OPR's SB 743 page, um, which Chris has shared on the screen. Uh, we weren't able to answer a few of the questions fully, um, but we will answer uh, remaining questions in the FAQ document we're preparing or in upcoming office hours. In the next few weeks, we'll be establishing regular office hours where we'll cover um, questions on the same or similar topics and be able to do that deeper dive. Please email your questions to sb743questions at opr.ca.gov if you have additional questions you weren't able to ask here. Um, we've already heard that sessions dedicated to rule implementation, tiering, and substantial evidence would be helpful. So that's what we have planned so far. Uh, we understand that your first priority right now is staying safe at home, and we thank you for giving us so much of your time today. Thanks.